to another episode of Collector's Quest. I'm Tyler this time, here with Johnny. Johnny, what's going on? I don't know. What's going on? I, last episode of Collector's Quest was not very popular. <laughs> uh, you just want to, like, get the sick burns in right now? You just want come to come off the cuff with that? The yeah, you're sick right. burns? Not... Ah, I yeah, get it. Yeah, get it. See? See what I did there? Yeah, All right. Really... No, no one liked it. No one liked it. No one listened to it. I thought people would listen to it because it was it was like a spec picks episode. People love that. Uh, shit. You know, and it's like uh, given what we learned from Portland, I was even talking about DVD games or Blu-ray games. Tyler, I I figured the kids would like it, but nope, <laughs> no nope, people were like, Mm-mm. people only listen to this show for me. It turns out, yeah. Well, you know, it did get a lot of uh, reposts, more than our normal reposts and more than our normal likes, but like half the listens. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Episode 206. So you want to collect Halloween games. Number five, current gen games. Not not interested. Uh, you know, and like I talked about limited run and I did not like completely shit on them. I was just like talking about games they made or that not they made, but they published and in a non cynical shitty fashion. And uh, yeah, people were like, nah, mm, that's not what I'm here for. It's yeah, I mean, they're here it's to hear weird. you dump on it. <laughs> I guess so, like, but but we've got criticism, like, how oh, you talk is so negative about them all the time, and I like their stuff. It's like, all right, like, I like some of their stuff, too. Tried to talk about it, did a whole episode where we featured, like, mostly games from, no one wanted to hear about it. No one wanted to hear about it, Tyler. No one wants to hear about Halloween games. Also, as I go through Instagram and do all my Halloween posts, my least liked posts of the year are always my Halloween ones, and I always lose like a hundred followers. Oh man, and you that should remain uh, true. Try posting some PC eighty eight games, especially ones that like don't have a recognizable uh, cover. Uh, how about I post some Atari ST games? Yeah, exactly. You, you think people people are they? The people don't care, Tyler. They're like, I don't, I I don't care what this is. I do not care about this. Uh, spooks and spiders, not a whole lot of likes. I, shouldn't, isn't that like the coolest stuff on Instagram? I mean, like, all right, we're everyone here is on Instagram for different reasons, but like, if I see a game that looks cool that I've never seen before, that is like the ideal post for me to see on Instagram. It's like, wow, a horror game for a platform I never think about and it looks cool? Let me look into this a little bit, or let me just enjoy that I'm seeing this rather than like, okay, great. You posted Gargoyles Quest 2. It's like, yeah, that's a cool, uncommon game. I've been, like, very aware of its existence for however many years I've been collecting games. Sorry yeah, to anyone who I, posted a Gargoyles Quest yeah, 2. Yeah, I'm, cool I'm with you, but, uh, you know, I don't, I don't Instagram, right? I even did, like, reels and stuff this year, and, yeah, people were just like, nop, nop. I posted Stranger a Stranger Things game. And it got my least likes out of all of my posts. It got less likes than Spooks and Spiders. But Johnny, how good Stranger did it make things. you feel? Because like, it's I, about I, how good it makes you feel. Who cares about likes? We're not. We're not here to, oh, to farm I for likes. I don't particularly care. I'm just. Can, I'm just confused by it. I mean, like the shit I post. Clearly, I, I post for myself. Like when I'm posting uh, Transylvania, you know, that's like for me. And the Count, the Scott Adams. Uh, yeah. You know, like, clearly, I post this stuff for myself. But it is confusing, like, when Spooks and Spiders gets a few more likes than Stranger Things, just, like, as properties. You just, like, I'm like, oh, well, you know, I, I'm, I've bombarded them with a lot of stupid shit. Let me show them, let me show them Stranger Things to make the people feel better. Nope. John, you have to go, feel better. just go back to, uh, like, Super Mario Brothers 3 is what it comes down yeah. to. Come on. Uh so Johnny, I we, we went to the Portland Retro Gaming Expo, which oh, is why we? I've been I, gone. It was so long ago. It w I know it. It feels like an out of date topic, which is why I wanted to kind of shift the point of this episode to be more general. It's not a recap okay. of the Portland Retro Game Expo. It's how I'm seeing the market shifting, how the hobby of collecting, I think, might shift in the future, based on what and I'm we, seeing at Portland after people weren't there for two years. Yeah, that. So we're using. Portland as a as a point of reference, but the the point of the episode is not the Portland Retro Gaming Expo. We are taking a single point of data and extrapolating it to the future, decades into the future, as if decades. 
yes, decades. Where I'm going to predict prices in 2060. We're doing it. Okay. <laughs> that seems crazy, but all right. Yeah. I guess we didn't even mention. Yeah, I got COVID at Portland. I guess we did mention that. Uh, but yeah, the sickest I've ever been in my life. Uh, I've basically been out for two or three weeks. I'm still a little bit sick, but I'm not doing too bad anymore. Um, it's a sick don't, pickup, bro. I've got, I've got like, I got all my vaccines. I was not careful at all at Portland. Like, I didn't wear a mask at you Portland. You sure weren't. Uh, and I touched a lot of video games. But yeah, don't get COVID. It was like the worst time of my life, pretty much. Uh, yeah, you were you were very sick. You still are sick. I still hear you hacking back there. Yeah. You, you do not got, sound Got like a great. persistent cough now. It's uh, It's no good. But no one wants to hear about me being sick. They want to hear about... No. My trip to Las Vegas twice, Johnny. I went hiking Ooh. in the desert. We saw absinthe. We went gambling. We got free beers. We didn't lose any money. We saw the lights. Uh, who's the we? That's the just we you. Is, is just me. That's just you. I did not do this with you. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, it, Johnny, so, Portland Retro Game Expo. Um, the retro gaming as a hobby is dying. There, let's start off with uh with that idea. Let's let's throw that out there as as a soft, so, not hot take. Okay, so you think retro gaming is dead? All right, and this I'm isn't not, just I'm, because some so, famous YouTuber told you this. We are a collecting podcast. We are not a gaming podcast, particularly retro collecting is dead, Johnny. No, it can't be. I just bought Spooks and Spiders. <laughs> Yeah, and how many likes did it get, Johnny? So not a lot. I'm I'm not saying that people don't want to buy old games anymore, but I literally people asked me what Atari games I got at Portland because I said multiple times, guys, I'm going to Portland just to buy Atari games. That's all I want to walk out of Portland with is a bunch of Atari games that I need. And I walk I, you know, at Portland I don't hang out at all. Like. I there like I found some Nintendo Age guys and I had some conversations with them. I met actually a lot of people. Shout out to everyone I met. Super nice meeting everyone. I met more people from the internet than I've ever met at any show I've been to. But I don't hang out and talk for like two hours. I'm there to just like go over the floor, just like again and again and again and again and find everything I missed. And there's no fucking Atari games, Johnny. Johnny, this is not the Portland Video Game Expo. This is the Portland Retro Gaming Expo. And there are no Atari games. I bought one Atari game, Dolphin, and I'm like only 40% sure that I don't already have Dolphin. Um, it, now, is it that retro gaming is dead or is Atari dead? So this Cause is... Because I saw a lot of Nintendo games. Yeah, obviously there's still a ton of Nintendo games. Uh, you know, honestly, not as many complete in box good things as I'd expect, but that's probably just the current. State I mean, I don't know I, the place I was hanging out. It just just lots of Nintendo games all over the place. Okay, complete in box. So forget Nintendo. Yes, it is are old games dead or is Atari dead? The point is the like the Portland Retro Gaming Expo. I understand is just a big video game expo. There are like a fucking ton of limited run games and P like limited run games literally had a booth, but just like PS4 games, more Switch games than anything you'd see pre NES. Uh, it's basically just and a generic video game. People were hot for the Switch games. They were they were all over the Switch games. But Johnny, most local stores don't really stock Atari. Like I know a lot of stores. I walk into them and I'm like, hey, you got Atari games? Or like, no, we don't sell those because literally no one buys them and then the other ones i walk into are like kind of you know shittily stocked so the place you would go to physically buy atari games is a an enthusiast retro gaming expo and like the premier enthusiast retro gaming expo portland yeah maybe next to like midwest gaming classic or, you know uh and you got like too many games on the on the other coast too many games but too many games isn't specifically retro so i'm gonna say Midwest Gaming Classic in Portland are the two big ones. And there's nothing, absolutely nothing, Johnny. This isn't me just complaining about Atari. It's like, this would be the one place to get them, and it's not here. And I think it's because the audience is getting younger, and obviously people are only interested in the current stuff they're playing and the stuff they played as a kid. Those are the main things they're playing. Like, obviously, you look around, most people are between, like, 20 and 40. They weren't growing up on Atari. But if it's not here, then is it just dead? I mean, I've said Atari is kind of dead for a long time. It had this resurgence 
um, with like the the grading crowd and the investors. So it like seemed like it was popular again, but I don't think people were ever really that hip on Atari. I mean, AtariH.com, the biggest uh, retro gaming forum saying, on the internet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's a bunch of old guys who have nowhere else to go. I so all right. Call me waxing nostalgic about the old days. Is waxing? Do I say waxing like that? Maybe I'm maybe I'm using you're, that word wrong. You're, but, you're fine. You're fine. All right. Go on. Uh, so if you're on like Atari, obviously on Atari Age, but like Digipress, Game TZ, Nintendo Age, when people had like a game collection, like obviously they have all the Nintendo stuff. Back back in the day when we're saying like N64 was garbage, you know, you have your Nintendo, your Super Nintendo stuff, all that stuff's cool. But then people were like. Check out my fucking Vectrix. Check out my Microvision collection. Who the fuck cares about Microvision? But it's like all this old shit was cool just because it was, you know, vintage retro games. And that stuff is so not cool anymore. Just because it's old and people think that everything old sucks, even at a retro gaming expo. Did did you see a Vectrex? I did not. I saw Vectrex games. I don't think I saw a Vectrex. But it was like one dude. I think he listens to the show. I think I spoke with him. Shout out. Yeah, I totally forgot your name. But yeah, he. I saw like one dude selling some Vectrex games. But his booth was like, here's all my cool odds and ends. I'm a, I'm a collector selling off like my weird extra stuff. And like no, he didn't have like Nintendo games. He had like all like the weird stuff. I'm pretty sure he had a box of Microvision stuff, literally. But okay. so... People say, like, you know, this is, like, not a shock to people. People are like, well, uh, duh, Atari's dead. No one cares about Atari. Uh, <laughs> it's just, it's just, if if the crowd that comes to these these conventions, the retro gaming conventions, which they're not, uh, I mean, you know, they got an arcade and all that, but they're not going to perpetually be interested in all retro games, then NES is going to age out. SNES is going to age out. More importantly, like Sega Genesis is going to age out. Sega Saturn is going to age out. Uh, and we, I, we can... I'm, I'm less worried about Nintendo consoles aging out. Absolutely. Because Nintendo yes. is like a, the, you know, first party Nintendo stuff that, you know, they do a good job of refreshing their characters and making those versions of those games available on newer systems. So I think those hold interest. Sega, I'm a little more worried for. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've I've spoken with multiple younger people who say, like, they think that Sega's cool, but, like, their friends think Sega is trash or just, like, yeah. completely outdated and unplayable. And because Se Sega, like, doesn't have the characters and the, the continuing franchises, like, people are not going back. Like, if you didn't grow up in the era, no one cares about fucking, like, Eternal Warriors. Or like no fantasy star, like I guess yeah, people care about fantasy star and Sonic, but like Dynamite Heady and uh, like Rise Star, like beyond the fact that a lot of these games are on like the Genesis compilations, so that's how people might know about them if they they weren't alive at the era. But like all of the 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 bulk of the library is gonna just fade into oblivion. I think. I'm I curious if you asked people. If they, and specifically worded this way, if they associate Sonic more with Nintendo or with Genesis, what they would say. Who would associate Sonic with Nintendo? What are you talking because about? Because all of the Sonic games are on Nintendo. They've been, there. more games have been released on, Sonic games have been released on Nintendos than ever were on any Sega console. Sure, but you wouldn't, I mean, it's still a Sega game. You wouldn't associate it with I, Nintendo. I, yeah, but I'm just, that's why I said not Sega, but with like Genesis. <laughs> because when I think of Sonic, I think of Genesis. I don't necessarily think of Sega, the corporation. I think of the Genesis sure. specifically. Um, so that that that's why I'm curious. Like, do I mean, people, I, I'm wondering if the new generation even realizes that Sonic is a thing that came from the Genesis. Yeah, there's probably an age cutoff where people just think Sonic and they think, oh, yeah, a weird 3D platformer with homing <laughs> jump attacks for some reason. Okay. And they just think of that style of game. Uh, but, yeah, I think I think Sega has a has a lot more to lose in terms of being, quote unquote, forgotten. Like, no one's forgetting about Atari. No one's forgetting about Sega. I'm just talking about, like, what's the most popular thing, what people are actually looking for, what people are interested in. But. As it relates to Nintendo, I do think that, <laughs> I, I mean, in my mind, I think we all have this perception of, like, everything we think is cool is evergreen. And there's there's obviously th 
things that aren't like obviously people know Atari Atari sucks blah blah blah. But like I, in my mind, like NES is evergreen. Obviously, NES is the first Nintendo system. is so important. Every, everyone should know every game on Nintendo because it's the, the most important Nintendo console. And I think there is an extent of that that will be true. And NES will obviously, you know, last forever in terms of collecting. But the way people who are like 40 years old think of the NES, where they're like super invested in deeply in the library, where they can think about games like the magic of Shahrazad and and Swordmaster, I think there is no future where you know, in, in 20 years that someone of a similar age is going to be at all as interested in the same stuff. I think if you remember, I mean, you do remember, but 2016 and 2017, like finally NES prices had started to plateau then. Like prices had been going up for like, what, forever. eight, 10 years, basically. I'm kind of forever, uh, but like seriously for 10 years. And uh, then it started leveling off because it's like, all right, people are kind of losing a little bit of interest in NES. And, you know, people still grow up now and they'll know Super Mario. They'll know Metroid. They'll know Donkey Kong. But th- who in 20 years is going to give a shit about Swordmaster? Who in 20 years is going to give a shit about stadium events? And I'm not saying the market for those games is going to collapse but I sure don't think more people are going to be interested in those games than there are right now. Yeah, I mean, you you might be right, and it, you know I I think the point you're you're trying to get to is uh, it's we're going to be more in the realm of nostalgia for specific games rather than for specific consoles. Uh, you know, we're moving away from the idea of you know this is the the thing we collect. Everyone collects NES. Now it's going to be more like they're just going to pick from franchises, um, you know, through their history, not so much focus on the, uh, you know, the the minutia of a console. No one's looking for, what is it, touchdown fever on the NES. Sure. A- another thing or with... Rock uh, and roll. With, uh, Do you know rock and roll is a pinball game? Uh... Is it rock and roll or rock and ball? No, it's rock and ball. Rock and yeah. ball. Okay. Yeah, rock and ball. Yeah. That's a pinball game. Does anyone even know about that game? Yeah, none of the I, pinball uh, games in NES I, are good. Don't. You, like, pinball's uh, probably the best. Full, full disclosure, I've been going through all of my NES games, finding out which manuals I, I missed. So I literally had to touch and look at every single game I own uh, for the Nintendo. And there were games I was like, oh, yeah, this is a Nintendo game. Huh. <laughs> And it happened a lot. And I'm like, I don't know, I would say on the very, very, very familiar side with Nintendo. And I was like, oh, yeah, this this game. This is, I have not thought about this game since probably I bought it. Like, I probably literally bought that and was like, okay, yep, good. And then never looked at it again. So there, there's a there's a lot of that on the Nintendo still. So going back to like the idea of a gaming convention, and this isn't really more the convention. This is more the idea of game collecting in general. There are there are thousands of new games every generation now, and the more games there are, the more space that takes up in people's collection. The more the more money that takes up if you in terms of like if you were to buy everything, and the more space that takes up competing for people's attention. So. When we were kids, Johnny, and we had Nintendo Power, and Nintendo Power talked about, like, the hot upcoming five games, for the next two months, like, there might as well have been five games that existed on planet Earth. And now, you go onto Steam, and it's like, here are the latest hundred games that came out this week. And, like, no game can have any amount of attention, you know, compared to how few games we used to be I mean, and that's, that's true not just of Steam, but on... All, on all the online components of every console, they're just like, here's our, here's a bunch of games. Our, here's our indie games. Here's the, here's a bunch of games that you know may see a physical release down the line, but they don't have them yet. Here's a bunch of old games that we remastered. It's just, it's overwhelming. There's so many games that it's, it's impossible. To, I think to gain, you know, the lion's share of attention unless you are like one of the, you know. $50 million games or whatever, you know, your last of us and, uh, sure. Yeah. You know, your, your super big, like, you know, S tier releases, which there aren't very many of, but that used to be like, that used to be it to your point. Like that was the tier of release that used to exist. 
So it's just like, all right, three months of these games, that's cool. And now, I mean, even even a game that's like an S tier release, what is it? Capture the mind, the mind share of the people for what a month, maybe. Yeah, and Instead I don't know how much of that is just me getting year. older, but yeah, there. I mean, there's also obviously a lot, lot more games, and games are cheaper and more disposable than they've ever been. Yes, um, true. And, and and bring that into collecting, like. This is a point I've made before, but if you're collecting in 2004, there are maybe, like, really 3,000 games in the entire world that matter, period. Like, if you collected every game you would ever want for every system you wanted, you would probably have, like, 3,000 games. And now there are, like, 3,000 Switch games alone, and there are people collecting the Switch set as it comes out. John, you probably know how many Switch games there actually are. How many are there? There's probably not 3,000. I think I think there's like 1,500, 1,400 right now. Okay. All right. Well, A lot. Add in some limited editions and variants and we'll, and and that, we'll get... Okay. Hold on. Push Let me qualify. There. That's that's official North American releases, and I, I don't think... That, I, I can't remember if that number fully counts any of the you know uh, region-free stuff. The Nintendo Switch is a nightmare. It's it's a literal nightmare. Every time I think about collecting for the Switch, I get anxiety. I I, so. I agree. I I'm so happy I never even tried to start. You know, I kind of did. I I was buying those early limited run games, but like for a little bit. But like kind of everyone was. But I'm so happy beyond that. I never even tried to start getting into Switch collecting. It's uh, I I, I like a lot of games on the Switch. I think it's a super interesting console. Might be one of the greatest libraries of all time. But uh, yeah, it it's insane to collect for. A bold bold statement. You like a lot of games on the Switch, the console that had every game ever ported to it, Johnny. Yeah, uh, yeah. I <laughs> I'm not saying that's controversial, but when I mean you talk about libraries for consoles, and if you're gonna put it pound for pound, it's like you can disagree and not like the strategy that they've used, but the some of the best games in the world are happen to be on that system, and it's uh, you know. If you stack up a library, you're just, I mean, you're going to count those games. What are you going to be like? No, I can't count them because I don't like ports. Get out of here. Uh, Yeah, that's exactly what I do. No, I it's know. not. Um, I'll find a way to not count them, Johnny. Okay. So we're, Anyways, we're in the future. Uh, we're in 2060 now. People are looking back at the NES. And now here's where I think uh, th- this is something that our friend Eric, Excite Bike Comics and Games, has yelled at me for collecting dumb bullshit before uh, or for thinking stadium events is cool at all. Because if you're into the history of comics, not only are there too many to like feasibly like for a normal person to think about, let alone read, there are like literally too many comics for any one person to know the entire history of every comic. Like there, there are just hundreds of thousands of comics, uh, tens of thousands of comics, even if you narrow it down to things that you could argue matter. Uh, so when we look at like the golden age of comics, 19 was it 39 is that when it starts to 1960 the flash when did the flash come out uh all right it, let's, let's say it's like 30 years uh we narrow that down in our heads and, and i'm not a comic collector but if i am i'm thinking the golden age there's like a hundred books not even for me for me i think of like 40 books over the span of 30 years and as important as we think Nintendo is, and I do think Nintendo is important, but especially when you get even later than when you get to like Super Nintendo and Nintendo 64, when the games aren't as important in a historical context, like Nintendo has a lot more firsts than the Super Nintendo. I'm sorry to say it. I know a lot more people like Super Nintendo games. People are really going to boil it down. Like if we boil down Golden Age comics to a few dozen books that most like there's more to Golden Age than that. But in terms of what people actually know and care about, it's like, all right, Action Comics 1, Sensation Comics, Flash Comics, uh, Captain America, uh, you know, then some first appearances we'll throw in there. There are probably uh, Golden Age, like, specialists who are like, guys, you don't understand, it's Action Comics. All these comics are the early history of Superman. This is the most important series of comics in all of comics. But 90% of people are just like, yeah, Action Comics 1 and everything else, whatever. Is there a key in there? Oh, yeah, we'll get Superman number one, too, sure. I, I think the investor crowd has been pushing the idea of keys, and they're they're trying to get that. And I, I think 
I think we'll get there eventually. And I think that speaks to where you think video games are kind of going that eventually the consoles will just be boiled down to what their keys are. And that's what people will be collecting, right? That's what you're trying to get at. Yeah, exactly. Uh, And then just, just to confirm, Golden Age was 1938 to 1956. And I know Golden Age gets boiled down to that, but if you were like a horror pulp guy, then there's so much good stuff in Golden Age. It's all the best stuff is there. And there's hundreds of books. I know that's not your point, but it just, for me, all the horror pulp stuff is there and I get so expensive. I can't afford to collect that and games and everything else I do. It makes me sad in my heart. And I'm not saying everyone's going to go back and, and collect the quote unquote golden age keys, but like, you know, there's going to be the specialists who collect, you know, uh, pre-code horror comics and there's going to be people who go and collect fucking Vectrix games. Well, that's probably not nearly as popular it's as not- horror comics, but you know what I mean? There's going to be specialists no, but, who care about this stuff, but it's not going to be Action Comics 1. No, I, I, and I think when you think about what YouTubers are, are going to be populating, so imagine YouTube in 20 years or whatever the platform is, and you've got your your content creator, and they're talking about it, and they're, you know, they're someone who can afford to be a content creator, so they're going to be like, what, 25, 22, or whatever, and what they're going to be talking about, they're going to be talking about uh, games of a bygone era, and they're going to just you know, there's going to be this list of keys that will be established. And again, there'll be your Metroid, your Zeldas. And then, you know, then you'll have people who will dig for some of the kind of lesser known cool stuff, but not like a true key. You'll get those people talking about some of these sub games, but yeah, I, I mean, I can see that this is, I mean, I feel, I agree with you. I feel like this is where we're headed, I, especially, you know, it, we can say that it's not a lot of games. It's still almost 700 games or over 700 NES games if you count all the unlicensed stuff. That's still like a, not You say that like there's already of hundreds of games that people already throw away in the NES library. They're like, my brain oh, yeah, there, doesn't have so enough many. capacity to deal with unlicensed and Sachin and PAL exclusives and home. what the fuck? Let me keep it to this 677, please. So, I mean, that brings up an interesting question. You just said PAL games. So, do you think in the world of... Uh, keys do you think some of the like your your gimmicks of the world do you think that these will get boiled down into keys and originality will just disappear as well and it'll just be like hey this is a key it just happens to be you know a pal game do you think that'll start to surface more or do you think think games like gimmick no one's going to give a shit about i don't so there are games like excuse me there are i should say mr gimmick since we're talking about the pal sure there are games like mr gimmick that have such a cachet around them that that will obviously carry into the future. Um, I I don't know in what form though. Like, how does that work in comics where like, if you look at the 1940s, you could point out all these stupid Batman and Superman keys and whatever, but like what I know golden age quote unquote stories are not good. I think there are, you know, it's very strangely written and sometimes humorously violent era of comics. But if there's just like an especially good comic, You know what I think it happens with? I think it happens with covers more than comics, uh, more than like stories. But if there's an especially good cover in comics, even though it might not be a key, you know, people remember that comic and there's a huge premium attached to that. And I think games like Mr. Gimmick or like on Famicom, people think of Eureka as like the expensive Famicom game. And it's like the one of the only Famicom games people in the West care about because it's like this three thousand dollar really fast shooter that people actually know. Yeah. There's actually not that many PAL exclusive NES games. There's a couple of Disney games. I, I know you like to dismiss Disney, Disney stuff, but Disney collectors are a force unto themselves uh, that we didn't get on the NES uh, in America. So I don't know. I wonder if some of that stuff will carry forward. I mean, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure there's people who collect Disney comics. Everything comes back to comics. I think everything's going to turn into comics, Johnny. Uh, Okay. I think some I mean, of this like seems obvious. I'm sure there are people like what there's no insight here. What are you talking like obviously this is happening? Like it was such a shock to me. I cannot like overemphasize how much of a shock to me that there were no Atari games at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo. And that means like no, there's no television, there's no Coleco, there's no fucking nothing. It was all NES and forward. And I spoke with a lot of vendors and they were like, I can't believe how good DVD games are selling. Cause they all People come to these shows with buckets and buckets and 
buckets of DVDs. People can buy 50 DVDs out of a bin and they will just reach under the table and throw 50 more DVDs in there. And by DVDs, we're talking, you know, Xbox, PlayStation, uh, Xbox 360, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, to include Blu-rays all the way up to PS4 stuff. Sure. Um, I want to. I want you to talk about that a little more because I, I think that's kind of what's missing from your insights and how shocked you are is because you did talk to vendors and you did get some insights from them. So tell more about the other stuff that wasn't selling, like Genesis. Like there was people literally declaring that it was dead. So it's not just that you didn't find Atari games. It was just what people said was doing well and then people just outright saying, yeah, these games are dead. I'm not even going to bring Nintendo games with me, which is crazy to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, it's a very general. Everyone had different experiences. Um, definitely the things I got the most, they, people were very surprised. People did very well on DVD games, they said. Um, I definitely got a lot of, not a lot of interest in Sega games, specifically like Sega Genesis, because that's the Sega games people had most of. There was this one guy, you can tell the story later, you bought a bunch of manuals off him. He had a fuckload of Sega Saturn. I'm talking... What do you have? Two hundred Sega Saturn games and like all the good Something. stuff, and 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 European Saturn stuff. Like, yeah, he had some really like good stuff. complete in box, not cracked cases. This was like he was selling a Saturn collection, and it was reasonable price, like price charting prices probably. But if you're looking for like good condition, complete Saturn games, and you're at a show with money in your pocket ready to spend, this is where you would buy it. And ten years ago, I would look at this table and I'd be like. This is going to be the most popular guy at the fucking show. And by the end of the show, he sold about half of it, which is good. But I couldn't believe that, like, se good Sega Saturn stuff, like, uncommon and rare Sega Saturn stuff just didn't sell out. Or, like, not even sell out, but, like, sell most of it, even. Uh, yeah, it was crazy how full his table still was at the end of the show. Things that I definitely expected to move did not. And I saw a lot of guys who did have Saturn stuff out just sitting there there was a few guys who came in and like i don't know what these people were thinking but they they priced game gear games like it was uh you know like crude oil or something i, I don't know what they were thinking. oh it dude and they had so the many duplicates there's yeah <laughs> there's like here's four copies of, of robotics mean bean machine but they're all six hundred dollars sorry the thing is like that would be like a holy grail find for someone who was shopping for game gear but the prices were so ridiculous like I don't know. And there was like multiples, like there were not going at this show with this demographic as it is now, I'm talking like 20 to 40 kind of normal people. There were not going to be multiple high end game gear collectors buying above market price. So I guess they just brought them out to get a little bit of wear on those boxes. Guys, th th we're talking about like a hundred game gear games complete in box that we were looking at. It was good stuff. It was crazy. They wanted so much money for their Game Gear games. I literally walked by and laughed a little, and then I didn't want to be rude, so I just walked away as quickly as I could because the prices, it wasn't like that. They were a little high. They were so high, and like, and I, I think that kind of encapsulates some of the things that were going on in the show. So I think there was a little bit of fear in the market, right, as, as we head towards a recession, but we're also still coming out of this, like, this haze of like, oh my God, we haven't had an official convention in three years. So everyone's going to be chomping at the bit to buy this. So there was this weird like split, right? So there was like people really wanted to buy things, but they didn't want to buy super expensive things. And sellers had brought some really expensive stuff, which didn't move. So I, I don't know. The, the vibe was a little bit weird. Oh, you, uh, I definitely agree, agree. If you if you had asked me eight months ago, I was like terrified of Portland because there's there's so much like that was when the market was going nuts and there's so much built up demand to go hunting at a show like this. And, you know, theoretically, like all these sellers have stock left over and they haven't been able to get to shows to let go as, of as much stock as they used to. So I thought there was just going to be all of this stock all these prices at all time highs and then all these people descending upon the stock, just like devouring it. Like I was, cause we had vendor, pa uh, uh, vendor passes. So for like the first few hours, we were like, vendors. <laughs> yeah, we were vendors, we, not we just that vendors, we had them. Of course. Uh, you know, before, like before all those, those dumb commoner people come in, we get to go scoop up all the actual deals. And like, I'm walking around and I'm like, you know what? Like, 
I didn't really find anything. It wasn't like uh, it wasn't as crazy as I thought it was going to be. The prices weren't sky high. The stock wasn't so, especially were, good. Some, I don't some, think that there was some prices that were just so out of line. But I then mean, but that, some I were mean, like, really yeah. There's so many vendors. Of course, there's going to be the crazy people who are like, well, I'm at a show. Let me just double the price and see what happens. Yeah. Um. And like, I don't think people were like clambering over each other to to dive and and buy games. It felt like like a pretty kind of normal kind of show atmosphere. Not at all like what I would have expected eight months ago. No, I yeah, yeah. it. It was exactly uh, the show that I would have expected if people had just been regularly going to shows and, you know, that this wasn't the biggest deal coming around in the last three years. Yeah, exactly. Um, it w- and it was weird. So, a- as we were mentioning, yes, we had a booth. Collector's Quest was there. You may have saw us. And if you did, hey, thanks for coming by. But uh, myself and Mr. CIB were mainly in the booth and Red the Game Shark was in there a little bit, too. And we had stuff we were selling. And... Red stuff actually wound up doing pretty well for the limited stuff he brought. My stuff, which I priced cheap into move, which was mainly cart stuff moved. A lot of Mr. CIB's uh, lower, I don't want to say lower cost stuff, but like the super expensive stuff didn't really move. It was like lower priced to like mid-tier games. And he had great prices on his box Nintendo stuff. And the condition was all like pretty good on most of his stuff. And he had some Saturn stuff that moved pretty well, but... Yeah, it like it wasn't the super big dollars. No one was taking like the four hundred dollars swings. You know, it was like I want to buy four hundred dollars worth of stuff, but I want to I want an armload of games for four hundred dollars. I don't want just this one good one. You know what I noticed? There was a lot of sort of like B grade, uh, higher end stuff. So I didn't see it. there wasn't like if there was like a super mint like super Metroid or something like I would have bought it at any price like I'm here I'm at a convention I've got money in my pocket yeah if I can upgrade my super Metroid or you know, like any game like that you know like 10 out of 10 awesome game I wasn't seeing that I was seeing a lot of like 7 out of 10 condition boxes 6 out of 10 condition boxes and people are asking big prices for them and they were not moving I think I think at least this crowd, which I think is a pretty representative crowd because it is the Portland Retro Gaming Expo, they were not interested in paying any kind of premium for any kind of box damage. And I'm not saying people want like super mint stuff, but people don't want stuff that's like even moderately rough. They want nice stuff, especially, you know, game prices in general is like good stuff is like $100, $200 now. And people don't want to spend if it has like a crease, if it has like a ripped flat, people just don't want it. So, and some of that, I, I think a lot of that super mint stuff that we used to like see where you'd go and you'd find like that one guy who had the crispiest of crisp boxes and you'd get in there. Like those games have all been graded now. So I just don't think you're going to see them on the show floor. I think people have let shifted over to trying to move that stuff on auctions. Uh, will that pan out for them? <laughs> Not if current auction prices are any indicator, but uh, you know, I, I think that's maybe what happened. I mean, it could be. I mean, I found some like mint, and, like I, I basically bought all of the like the the cellophane NES games uh, that I Should found. Should we talk about that? Your one ridiculous uh, non-purchase. I mean, I guess like there was bread. this one guy. So this this was actually one of the th- the the big thing I bought. The best thing I got at the show actually, um, and it was the thing I got you know before the public was allowed to go and buy stuff. There was a guy. He had maybe ten Super Nintendo games, and like eight of them were like fucking nine out of 10, 9.5 out of 10 condition. All of them had the cellophane on them and all the boxes were nice. A couple of boxes had like, you know, a dinged corner and like a scuff, even though it had the cellophane. It's like, ah, fuck those. That's so disappointing when it's like, oh, it has all this mint stuff, but then like it's fucked up anyway. But like eight of these games were super nice, super mint. Um, One of them was Zelda, A Link to the Past. It was $300 and I bought it immediately. It is like the nicest Zelda A Link to the Past I've ever seen in my life. Um, But the other ones were all like kind of B-list games. He had like Brain Lord. uh, And then he had Illusion of Gaia and Breath of Fire, which I understand are like popular Super Nintendo titles. But uh, to me, like I I have no attachment to Breath of Fire and Illusion of Gaia has always been like the cheap RPG in terms of my collecting career, and I realize now it's like probably over a hundred dollars complete in box, but that game cost nothing for a long time. That was like not a popular game. So I'm not, I wasn't looking to like immediately snap these up, but they were something I was thinking about the entire show. I thought about buying them like literally the first hour I was on the floor, like, oh shit, mint illusion of Gaia, mint breath of fire. It was like $200 and $220. 
I forget which one cost more. It was two forty oh, and two. It was, and it was two fifty for Breath of Fire, and I it was like one ninety for uh, Illusion of Gaia. And yeah, it came I, out to I, four. I looked at them; they were in such nice shape. He had some other shit that I didn't care about. They were in such nice shape. I'm like, no matter what these cost, there's no way we're gonna go three days and these don't sell. These could be priced at five hundred dollars. They're fucking mint. They're going to be gone. And we came back the last hour of the show. That dude sold nothing. I don't even think like those prices were like that bad. Like two hundred fifty for a mint breath of fire. It's worth that. I think. No one bought it on the entire show floor. It was, that was the craziest thing to me. 20,000 people are there. No one buys a mint Breath of Fire for $250. And, and then I tried to have like down. It's not like you didn't have any offers for it, because he did. Yeah. So those games together would have been $450. Or er, $440. And I, I, like, I couldn't believe they didn't sell, but they guess what? They didn't sell, meaning there, there wasn't the demand to buy these games. So I offered him $400. 10% off after three days of people not wanting to buy these games. And he said no. And I'm like, all right, fuck. He's like, no, they're too nice. And I, and Tyler had already bought it $300. And I was incensed. And Tyler was like, just let it go. And I was just like, like whatever. Like, okay, I buddy. didn't want them that bad because they're not like, the, the games yeah. don't mean anything to me. They were just kind of too it, nice to pass it, up. It was just, it was just the, the audacity kind of like, hey, you don't want to sell your stuff? That That's fine. But it was just like, it was it was the dismissive tone of it, like you were insulting him. I'm like, you just offered him ten percent, and you paid the full boat on a Zelda earlier. You'd already transacted. It was like okay, uh, and it was the the last. It wasn't even the last hour, Tyler. It was the last like ten minutes of the show. Yeah, it was like it was, it was like, like the last I, person we talked to. Yeah, a final call had been rung. You know, the bell was rung, and people were had already packed up and gone. And he was just like, no. And like when you looked at his booth. Not much insult, so I was just like, "What? What are you hanging on for?" So, you know, uh, that kind of stuff drives me crazy when people are just like, "Nope, I would rather, I would rather rot and die with the stuff I'm getting for 40. And now, now I'm like looking at Breath of Fires. I saw one, maybe it's not quite comparable, but there's like one for 180. I think you could look at that looks like it has all the stuff and doesn't look terrible. Um, you know, so it's like if that cello okay. premium though, Johnny. I know, but who cares? Yeah, I know. It's just I mean, plastic. Yeah. <laughs> nice is nice. Um, anyways. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, it's that guy's stuff. He can do whatever he wants. With I just thought, I was so shocked because he didn't sell very much. And then he was like, nope. And I'm going to continue to not sell stuff. I'm I'm making a choice. And I was like, oh, all right. Uh, I mean, if you want to talk about people who didn't sell stuff, uh, there was someone there who embodied the spirit of the Portland Retro Gaming Expo, Johnny, and it's the guy who had a booth selling only TI-99 games. And he only. said he did well. <laughs> and mostly cart only. He had, like, one small box of complete and box TI-99 games, a bunch of boxed computers, and then, like, a whole bunch of boxes of cartridges what the fuck did that guy sell the entire weekend? I know he sold, he had a shitty condition Tunnels of Doom, the uh, the floppy version, kind of rare, but it wasn't in great condition, so I passed on it. That sold. I don't think he sold a goddamn other thing the entire weekend. It, some of the stuff there was crazy. There, you know, some people were bringing in, like, toys and stuff. Anyways, that, I, mean, I think we're getting too much into like, sure, what sure. was on the show floor. But, uh, you know, it... If we're looking at Portland as a microcosm of what the market is going to look like and like what people's buying appetites are, I mean, it, it is just an expo and that's not necessarily indicative of what's online, but I, buyers were more passive than I expected them to be. Nintendo games didn't do as well as people said they were going to do. Um, like I'm talking NES NES Nintendo, like are sold, but I, I think people in general said they they weren't selling as hot as they want, and the, like the prominence of uh, you know DVD and modern generation games doing so well was crazy to me. And I, I that the DVD stuff speaks to that. Like I want to buy an armload of games. I want to spend this hundred dollars, but I don't want to buy a hundred dollar game. Sure. You know what was crazy? Uh, at the end, the people that were right across from your booth started selling. Uh, they had uh, basically like um, all of their Xbox 360 bins and like Wii and, and shit. They just lowered everything to a dollar at the end. 
and I'm looking through these bins. It's like all the Mass Effect games, all the, you know, like Uncharted and and Halo, all that kind of stuff. And it was all a dollar each. And like, I couldn't bring any of it home. And obviously they didn't want to bring it home. But like, fuck, it is so cheap to collect some of this shit if you get like the deals. Yeah, like if you were, man, I, I wish, it, uh, well, like if I lived in Portland, which I'm glad I don't. Um, oh, but if if <laughs> if I if we would have been there and I could have just like taken that stuff home easily, I would have because it was all like again, it's you just look at it and you're just like these are all great games. And if we're talking about that, people are going to be selective as they go down and look for nostalgia games, not necessarily the rarest or weird one off stuff they're gonna pick. They're going to pick the games that were great and people really want, uh, you know, supposed keys. Then this is, these were the things to have. And they were a dollar, Tyler. They were a dollar. A do- like, and I'm not talking like one bin. This guy had like eight full bins of DVD games that were all like a dollar. And I bet I could have negotiated. I bet I could have been like, how much you want for all of it? And I would have got him at like 50 cents a game. Oh, yeah. I've had. So, I mean, we talked about that one guy who wouldn't negotiate with me. I was buying dollar Genesis manuals. There was a guy who had a dollar bin of Genesis manuals. And I, I was like picking throughout it throughout the show. And, and you know, one day, one time I went up there and I'm like, all right, let me. They're a fucking dollar. Let me just get like literally one of everything. And like it was good stuff. It, it was it was sports mostly. But like it, he had the mindset that all sports are equal. All sports are garbage. Let me just throw all the sports in here. So you like like Tecmo, Tecmo hockey and like NHL 98, like games that aren't worth anything, but like clearly are a step above your Madden 93 type stuff that you're going to see like 500 copies of. Uh, and I got fucking all of it. I got like 35 manuals. And then he still gave me a discount on top of that. He's like, ah, how about 25 bucks? Yeah. <sighs> Crazy. I mean, most people were haggling and doing deals. Everyone I approached uh, was willing to work deals for the most part. Um, I do have one more uh, thing that I asked people about, and it was uh, loose cartridge sales. Specifically, I got mixed opinions on this. I had some people, I- I'd say most people told me that they were uh, like, disappointed in how well their loose cartridges specifically loose nintendo cartridges sold this year compared to previous years uh the one guy's closest to the arcade they said they brought six bins of games and that on any other year they would have sold five of those bins of games and they only sold through one bin of games this year and then uh another guy very similar situation he had about six bins of nintendo games he sold one bin he sold like a fifth of his stock and he's like, oh, yeah, I did great. And I'm like, looking around, I'm like, okay, <laughs> you sure have a lot of Nintendo games left. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, if I was to give my impression, I would give the impression that loose cartridge stuff was not as popular this year. And it, that could just be because of the declining popularity of cartridge games in general compared to previous years. I, I think that, but also I think a lot of people price their cartridge stuff too high because I priced my stuff like to go and it all went. Like all, right. all my cartridge stuff went really fast. All right. I mean, maybe people, I, I wasn't looking at prices. Like I only go through the cartridge stuff to, uh, to cert, like basically catch people slipping on variants. I didn't find anything, man. It could be that like this, these are the, is this just like the same stock that gets dragged out to every single convention. So it's all just like the leftover, like beat up, not exciting variant stuff. Cause you know, I'm, I know all like the, the exciting screw variants. I know like all the little like TMs and, and stuff to look for on some like special cartridges. And I'm not fine. I'm, I looked through the entire show floor. I didn't find a single cartridge to buy. I don't think, I think I bought, uh, I bought the legend of Zelda, like a uh, upgrade cartridges for my copies of the legend of Zelda. That's all I bought. You bought a that legend of Zelda was really nice. I did. I think, uh, my nicest copy came from, uh, rusty Gerard, uh, who, uh, NES homebrew guy. Real cool. He was right in the middle of the floor. Anyway. Anyways, um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's, Let's talk about let's transition into the other part of the market. So let's let's move away from Portland and then talk about what uh, you know as what we're seeing playing out now. You've got you've got some. Oh, you want to talk? talk so the Heritage Auction signature auction, the first half happened today, Johnny. Is that what you're talking about? That is what I'm talking about. Yes, I think this this is fairly predictable. Like. When you hear Pat the NES Punk say, oh, these stupid idiot investors, the sealed game market is crashing. It's like, all right, 
Pat the NES Punk saying it, like, you, you would imagine that he would, like, be comparing uh, grades that aren't comparable or, like, comparing the desirable variant to the non-desirable variant in, like, a very dishonest way to make his point better because he's, he's Pat the NES Punk. He needs to get the clicks on YouTube. Um, it is It is shocking to me just how real the sealed game market crash is because I don't like speaking in terms of hyperbole. You know, if the game market, if, if like this game's market went down like 10, 15 percent, I'd be like, all right, it cooled off a bit because it got too hot. Some crash. But like there are games that were selling for like a hundred thousand dollars that are now selling for just under ten thousand dollars a year later. It is it is crazy how much some of this stuff has crashed. It is very exciting to see the big price uh, swings are, are very exciting. Um, Just some some ones I picked it's out real today. bad. It's real bad. The, yeah, these might not even be like the biggest swings. These are just like some of the the ones that I definitely noticed. Um, a copy of baseball, uh, it just sealed copy of baseball, not like a sticker seal. It sold and he has uh, black box baseball. Black box baseball at the beginning of this year, I think in January or February for one hundred forty four thousand. The same copy sold today for fifty six thousand. So just losing a hundred grand by flipping a game a year later. Good job. Ca- Casual 1K loss, no big deal. 100K loss. Uh, a circle seal double dragon. These are everything I'm talking about is the exact same grade or the exact same copy, by the way. A, l- a lot of these were the same copy being flipped. I, I don't know. Oh, people do that for some reason. <laughs> Just flip a game a year later and think they're going to make Well, money. you know, back in the day, it was like, by back in the day, I mean, uh, you know, uh, six months ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, everyone thought they were getting free tendies uh, by buying games. So circle seal awesome. double dragon. I don't. They're like the the high end groups talk about circle seal double dragon like it fucking matters. Like double dragon sucks. I mean, maybe I'm sucks so I'm bad. alone in that. Especially opinion. on Nintendo. I know you Get agree with here. me on that opinion. Double dragon sucks balls. I don't care how somewhat classic of a of a series or game double dragon is. Fuck double dragon. Uh, also, the circle but Tyler, is not it's rare. It's an arcade port of a classic game. Don't you want to just relive that arcade experience where you and your friend play a- as as Billy and Jimmy and and our double dragons and fight alongside each other on your NES? Don't you want to do that? I feel like there are there are like universal arcade experiences that everyone had and everyone loves. You know, playing Gauntlet with your friends, playing Turtles with your friends, playing Battletoads with your friends, things like that. Like Double Dragon is so not one of those experiences. And I realize I'm out Tyler. of, I'm like not in the right generation for that. But fuck Double Dragon compared to I'm, all of these like classic playing Street Fighter, playing Mortal Kombat with your friends. These are games like I very specifically remember very specific matches I've had with people. Like what I don't remember playing Double Dragon with anyone ever. Tyler, you know why you don't remember playing Double Dragon with anyone? Because Double Dragon on the NES is stupid, and it's it's a two-player game, but it's alternating two players. It's not you both playing co-op, because they couldn't get it to work, so they just made you alternate. And they took Jimmy and made him the villain and totally, like, make the story... Double Dragon on the NES is stupid. It should not be played. It's not a classic... Double Dragon on the Genesis might actually be worse. They're all kind of hot garbage. This is not like some classic to be held in like high esteem. I don't understand why Double Dragon gets the clout. It's a C minus game at best. All right. Strong agree. Uh, also, the Circle Seal is not rare compared to the Oval Seal sealed. There's like there was some hype on the Circle Seal. If you look at the Wada Pop report, they're like practically even. Anyway, a year ago, one sold for $72,000. Same grade today sold for $13,000. A hot dip of 60 grand. Damn. Percentage wise, that is a big dip. Uh, It was a Super Mario Brothers 2. I don't remember what grade. Probably like a 9.6 A plus. Uh, $78,000 a year ago, $48,000 today. That's notable just because it's fucking Mario and it still crashed like 50%. That's ouch. And then um, um, Super oh. Mario Brothers 3 is kind of so common that it, it, there's no dramatic fall. Like that baseball like dropped a hundred grand almost in less than a year. And it was the same exact copy. And like black box baseball doesn't sell every week. But you know what sells every week? Super Mario Brothers 3. And you know what sells every week? Like even in like the same grade, Super Mario Brothers 3. So a right bro Super Mario Brothers 3, 9.8 A plus last year. 
$34,000. And then I think at the beginning of this year, $27,000. Then this summer, $22,000. Today, $8,000 for a 9.8 A plus Bright Bros. That's like a mint game. 9.8 A plus, I would call it a pretty nice game. Yeah, uh, 60% drop off there between the last sale. And then, you know, ooh, just... Like seventy five percent from the peak. That's a rough drop. Demolished. And I, you know, if you want to go through all this stuff, I'm sure Pat the NES Punk is going to have a hour long video once this auction is over. It's continuing tomorrow. Uh, there was a like a a mint um, hang tab Super Mario Brothers sold for like seven hundred thousand um, dollars. That's not a drop off. Uh, there was one that sold for two million, but that was a nine point eight, and this one was a nine point six. So this was more like in line. And then there was like a a Mario Bros, uh, last print Mario Bros. So it's like two hundred fifty grand. It was like a nine point six A or something. That seemed crazy to me, but it was probably just Eric Nairman uh, shill bidding it up because he has a sticker sealed one. That's all. That's the only way. If everything is crashing and like fucking random, a late print Mario Bros goes for stonks. It's like all right, I'm calling it market manipulation. <laughs> all right. Um. So. That that's that's interesting. That so, uh, outlook for sealed games, Tyler. What is it? Buy them now. I get. I don't know. I mean, everything's still yeah. I mean, like eight grand for a Mario three is still a lot of money. But I don't I'd buy it now. I guess I don't know. I, like thirteen I, grand I for seen... Double Dragon. Like I'm not gonna call thirteen grand for fucking Double Dragon a deal. It's sixty thousand dollars on sale. And I'm still like, that's not a deal. Fuck that game. Yeah. So uh, I, I have no I, idea. I'm I'm very leery of calling these investment grade collectibles at, at this point. So I would just be, if you're the type of person who is like looking to heavily invest in this stuff, be careful. Uh, now that you've seen some of the drop offs, you know we we're entering probably a recession. Uh, and if not, it's a weird financial time and there's a lot of uncertainty. So, um, I don't know if this just is a, you know, a moment in time that represents that uncertainty and things will bounce back or if people are just off games, what do you, what do you think? Uh, you know, what is something that I think no other fucking shitty source is going to tell you, especially Pat the NES punk. I, 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 I'm not, I'm not a Pat the NES punk hater, by the way. Um, I know Johnny definitely is, and probably most people I, listening I don't, to the show. I, I don't <laughs> hate them specifically. I just, I I get, I have a hard time with the bullshit that comes out. Like, when you get super upset that, you know, Wada and, like, was on Pawn Stars, oh my God. and you're okay, like, yes. I can't believe this. And you're like, huh, I wonder where they could have gotten the idea to go on Pawn Stars, Pat the NES Punk. So, this... Uh, signature auction this is supposed to be I, I don't know if the one at the end of the year is supposed to be the best but their signature auction is supposed to be like the fucking primo grade a-list stuff this is where you see like sealed first print zelda this is where you saw that 9.8 a plus plus super mario 64 um this is where you see like a hang tab castlevania it's like it's this is where you see like the crazy shit come out and like i under everything is like dropping like a fucking rock right now but this Signature auction was not like the absolute primo stuff. Like fucking baseball, the black box games besides Super Mario Brothers and Mario Brothers, it's like baseball, Popeye, and pro wrestling, and it's like, and, and those sold for a lot of money. But um, I don't know. There was a lot of like no seal stuff. There was a lot of complete in box stuff. Like there was there was a first print Zelda, but it was complete in box, and then all the other Zeldas are fucking oval seals, and it's like. This is a signature auction. Isn't this where I should be able to buy like a mint round seal Zelda? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, where, I'm, not, I'm where, not. It's not like I'm. It? I'm here to buy two hundred thousand dollar games. I just thought that the lineup was weak, and and because the games are weaker than a lot of the signature sales have been, that could contribute to why uh, some of the prices drop. To lower prices, around. yeah. There, there's no hype in the market, and f. If the bigger fish are looking at this, they're like, mm, this doesn't look like it's worth my time. So their money isn't entering the pool. Um, they're not driving the, the cost. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, as I said, that's why this is a moment in time. I'm unsure. Could it be all of these things? Is it multiple factors? Will we see a rebound in the next one if there's a good lineup? But it also makes me ask the question, where are the good games, Tyler? Why aren't they here? 
Uh, I think people aren't selling them. Cause, like, if you so the funny thing, actually, you know, let me let me take that back a little bit. There were some really nice uh, N sixty four games, uh, like nine point six A plus plus. There are two different Zelda Ocarina of Times, nine point six A plus Mario Kart sixty four is super desirable. Nine point two A plus plus Mario Party, that's a really desirable game. And all of those games fucking tanked compared to you know what they would have sold for, obviously, uh, uh, you know, a year ago. Even though that is like that's like primo N sixty four stuff, but I think the the people who have like the highest end stuff like fucking you know the best NES stuff are not selling it right now because they know the no, market's can, fucking tanking. Why would you they sell can stuff right to now? Wait. Yeah, they if can you're a millionaire and you don't have to sell stuff, why the fuck would you? The people selling this stuff are are either very unfortunate that they sold it right now, or they probably like have debt or things to pay off that they have to get rid of some of these games. Yeah. I mean, that was going to be my next point. It's like uh, those people who who have the good stuff don't have to sell right now. So uh, it'll be interesting if we start to see those people unload those games. If we start to see the really good stuff being offloaded like for NES at like low prices, that means the confidence in in it as an investment is completely gone, Um, which is a which is a a bigger higher level warning signal than this though uh i've got i've got red red flags everywhere at the moment uh yeah oh a max rifle sold for ten thousand. is that a good price mm, there's like stuff i wish uh, i had yeah. money for man there I, was... I, I don't a max <laughs> rifle i think is like cool if you have it with the game but also like i just don't want a max rifle in my house like where do you put it and like yeah it's cool but like what would i do with it a Which doc- is a weird thing to say because what would I do with most of this stuff? But like functionally, I gotta just put it somewhere. So it's probably just leaning up against a bookshelf in my wall forever, and I don't like the idea of that. Donkey Kong competition uh, cartridge, Johnny. Uh sixty six hundred dollars complete in box. It's, it's old for that. That seems like kinda okay, doesn't it? Uh, like so if you scroll through these listings, like that's a relatively low price. Like a Nintendo Power One in 9.4 condition sold for twenty four thousand dollars, and for a fourth goodness. of that, you could get a complete in box fucking Donkey Kong competition. Like what the fuck? Hmm. I don't know. L- l- hold on, I'm gonna look at the uh, the notes here. Maybe there was something that's like ah, it's moldy and ripped, and you don't want it on the back. Let's take a look here. Cut in case bottom. I don't fucking care. All right. Yeah, I'm trying to. I mean, they're listed at like seven thousand on eBay, seventy thousand. What's well, seven thousand? But that is that sold. just the cartridge? Yeah. Let me let me look. None have sold recently. Well, one sold today, Johnny. I mean, I'm talking about eBay auctions. None have closed on eBay. There, there's a bunch of for sale. Uh, at higher prices than that. So would I say that is a deal compared to what's available? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think someone did all right. I mean, there's a cartridge only for 4500 out there as well. It's crazy how expensive this game has gotten. I'm just I'm just browsing some some stuff right now, Johnny. Uh, a 9.8A Final Fantasy VII first print, uh, $5,000. That feels like an absolute collapse. I know we've seen one of those with an A seal for over $100,000. Uh, 9.6A long box Resident Evil, $40,000. Um, that's definitely been well over $100,000 before, right? I I don't remember. You would have to... We would have to check on that. I mean, I know we did an episode when... Uh, as you would say, the market was euphoric. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't know if, uh, I don't know what those prices were. I remember us talking about when all the big PS1 stuff was hitting. There was that one big signature auction with all the PS1 stuff. Yeah. Uh, and people were getting super hyped. Johnny, 9.A, 9.4A Tomb Raider. Like, I 100% recognize that's like a shitty grade. Um, I swear we saw one of those for a hundred thousand dollars. Maybe it was like a 9.6 a, I know we saw like a shitty condition tomb Raider for way too much money before. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we collapses. There are some collapses and it's for some of them. You have to go back to the all time highs of last year, but man is just, if you want to just see some like absolute catastrophes, guys, just go through the heritage auction prices. (laughs) 
Yes, I mean, 9.4A I know, like, cat- sold in July, last July for $144,000 and it sold for less than 10 grand today. <laughs> I mean, th- and these are only collapses if you bought them at those high prices. Yes. Uh, if you were buying them three years ago, what we would have said the prices are, you just made so much money. Yeah, that's true. Um, a funny thing is people are watching, uh, there's a streamer, Ms. Kiff, who is heavily invested in like Nintendo 64 games. And like some NES and like GBA stuff. And he was just watching the stream and keeping tabs of like how much money he lost just based on these prices. He's like, ah, I lost $200,000 compared to stuff. He like just bought like, uh, like a, a mint, uh, like a near mint, uh, Super Mario Brothers three for $15,000. And then like one in identical condition on heritage auction sales for 8,000. Yikes. Uh, I don't have the stomach to, to just lose money like that. Yeah, I, I, uh, if if I'm paying eight thousand dollars for a video game, Johnny, it's for a game that will never come up for sale again. Not for a game that will come up for sale in the next Heritage auction. But yeah, uh, yeah, agree. That's just me. Okay, all right. So, uh, market outlooks. You got you got any final notes you want to tell to the people? No, something I was thinking about was uh, will the how is the playability of games going to change collecting going forward? I don't know if this is even a different topic, but I was thinking about it when we were talking about the dollar bins of Xbox 360 games, because we've, sp- we've spoken about this before, but when you're collecting Atari and Nintendo and Vectrix, you could literally play every game you have. And if you're going through dollar bins of Xbox 360 games, literally in one purchase, you can buy more games than you'll ever play in your life. And it's just, it's very different when you are specifically buying games not to play them. And I think that's already like the most common thing in the game collecting hobby. There are a lot of people in denial, but the most common thing to do is to buy games and understand you're never going to play them. I mean, also games are so much longer now. Yeah, exactly. If you buy Mass Effect, how many Nintendo games can you beat in the same time it takes you to beat Mass Effect? Yeah, exactly. Um, maybe it doesn't matter because retro gaming's dead, and and you know people don't want Atari games, and soon people won't want Nintendo games, and <laughs> to the concept of it just doesn't matter. It'll be weird to see where where it shakes out. Do people read comic? Like comics are so easy to read; they're like fucking twenty, thirty pages long. Uh, but I don't know. It's weird. What do we do? It, it comes back to like just me thinking about like, what are we doing with our lives? Like I, I have so many more games than I could ever possibly play. Um, obviously. Why, why am I buying them, Johnny? Because they're great. Just just because just video games Look, are cool. We were, but we were, but we were buying them before their people wanted to invest in them anyways, just because we like games. And, yeah, obviously, I like games. Um, no, and, I mean, but I mean, I'm just saying we were here before that. So we weren't thinking about what are we doing with our lives on like the money and stuff and the time we're like, Oh, well, this is just something we enjoy. So that's what, why we're here. Why are we here? Why are we doing this? Cause we like it. Uh, could we be doing something with our, better with our lives? <laughs> Probably. Like, I mean, most definitely think of all the languages we could have learned. No, learning languages sounds like the worst. Think of all the math you could understand. <laughs> that, you could have invented that something. way better, Johnny. Thank you for bringing me back in. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I mean, I don't know what interests you. You're, I mean, vi- video think, games, Johnny. <laughs> Tyler, Literally you waste your time. Games. You waste your time doing so many weird things, and I, by, by waste, I mean use. Uh, you know, you'll watch content on all the weird collectibles. Oh my so, God. I, I mean, watch so I many like sports card and Marvel card channel. I know so much about fucking Marvel card investing. You want to know another category that's fucking imploding right now? Marvel cards. Do you want to know? Not only do I not give a shit about Marvel cards, I don't even like Marvel. I, I've seen none of the MCU movies. I don't read Marvel comics, but I watch these fucking channels that have like 9,000 subscribers talk about the Marvel card market just because I want to know what the fuck's going on in collectibles. Sorry. All right. There's, there's two more things I wanted to bring up. And I don't remember one of them right now, but I can remember the first one. Okay, uh, I have one to bring up too. In terms of the shifting demographics thing again, and Atari not being at Portland Retro Gaming Expo. And I, I feel like it's it's so obvious that people don't like Atari. It's just such a shock to me that even at the retro-focused thing, there's nothing. 
Also, I'm just going to say the pinball and arcade was a little bit cut down this year too. Whatever. It's expensive to keep that stuff running. I know. Oh, um, and like none of the Atari guys were there, which was weird. None of the Atari the show. Oh, they went to, they went somewhere else this year. There's a, there was another show that they, they all went to in October. Um, which is why they weren't at Portland, but also like they weren't drawing huge crowds at Portland. So I kind of understand yeah. uh, also just like in general, the guest list at Portland sucked. And I know we're getting into just like how the show was, but like you got, were we at Portland when you got like fucking Alexi pageant off <laughs> sitting behind you randomly yeah. to sign stuff. And then like walking yeah. out of that same show, I got like Howard Phillips to sign my copy of Nestor's funky bowling. I didn't get a yep. single fucking autograph from anyone at this show. Cause it was all YouTubers. Yeah. And I mean, maybe that's just not for us. Um, maybe, maybe the demographic now likes that, but that's not, I don't want to see that stuff, but I did enjoy the show. Uh, so I, I don't want I don't want to sound like we're dunking on the show. Cause I had a really good time in Portland and I saw some really cool stuff there, but back into the market stuff I want to bring up and you can give me your take on this. How much do you think the new 1099 tax implication is hurting people? Do you think that's like What's the new 1099 you think that's tax implication? Well, like on eBay now with like your limits at six hundred dollars. Like, do you think in, in the general not not the show, but like, do you think that's affecting the market? Like, do you think we're not seeing as good as stuff because now the tax implications on selling really good stuff on eBay is? I mean, is, you uh, are, you were always supposed to pay taxes on your eBay sales. Yeah, I, so I they, know. I know they were just making like, it. You didn't have to. They were just doing more reporting, but like. I, I guess I, I don't know how much it will be. How many people were breaking the law before? Was everyone just like not reporting income on their taxes before? Yes, Tyler. Okay. That's, yeah. All right. Absolutely. You guys, and you complain about the billionaires. Um, well, I'm just saying, like, if everything is now like a tax sheet, you know, an itemized report that you have to fill out for income, um, I'm I'm just wondering if that's going to affect what people pump into eBay, um, you know, the quality of the stuff that they put out there. So I don't if we're think gonna so. See if I, Cause if I have B-tier like a thousand dollar game, I want to sell, like, what am I going to, I'm not going to put it on fucking whatnot. I have no presence there. I'm not going to grade it and send it to heritage auctions. I'm going to just put it on eBay. So yeah, I have to pay taxes on it, but I also have to pay like a shitload of eBay fees and I'm going to lose a ton of money and shipping and I have to deal with shitty buyers I think it's just the cost of doing business, and I think people are used yeah, to it. Yeah, well, I mean, yes, but also considering that and knowing that, I just kind of, as a buyer, knowing that this exists, and as a seller, like I just kind of would have expected more stuff to be happening at Portland, and if to see more, more like the big deals, and I just wasn't seeing that, like the bigger ticket items, because I could definitely sell a thousand dollar game there. And not have to report it if I was being that way. Sure, right? sure, sure, sure. And and knowing that I'm not paying eBay fees on it, like I can, you have some room to like cut deals on stuff. So both buyer and seller feel like they're making out. And I just wasn't seeing that. Yeah, and and you know, there's people obviously itching to buy stuff. Yeah, I didn't see a lot of the the super high end stuff. And like the stuff I did saw was like you know the kind of clearly overpriced stuff where like even like a fanatic is not going to pay that kind of price. Yeah, yeah, I just wasn't. Well, seeing I it. mean, it was like the Game Gear stuff. I'm like, I would like some of this stuff, but this is this is ridiculous. Like, what are we doing here? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if the eBay is affecting that. I think that people are just going to put up with the cost of doing business on eBay, just because that's where business happens. Like, yeah, you could sell on Facebook groups. It's a much bigger pain in the ass. Obviously, whatnot's the biggest pain in the ass. I'm sure. Um. Do we talk about how much the whatnot auction sucked? Did we already have that episode? <laughs> no, we kind of just did that live uh, on the Discord as we were talking. Like, we we can go into a like I think that's our we're done with the market talk. Do you want to just talk a couple key takeaways from the show that aren't market related? Things that we saw, things that we liked and didn't like. I mean, me, I mean, even, sure. I think I've said most said, of what just I want very quickly because this is not. Yeah, I know, I know. We've but talked what, about. What are you talking about? Yeah. So the whatnot auction was a fucking train wreck. Uh, so they sent us into this room. There's no Wi-Fi. There's no Wi-Fi reception, especially if you have like shitty T-Mobile reseller. You can't bid live. So everyone's staring at their phones and like people have connection issues. It's laggy as fuck. But they have a solution. They brought their own Wi-Fi, so you could like talk to one of the organizers to get on their Wi-Fi, so you can get on whatnot on your phone. 
Except their Wi-Fi sucks too. I'm I'm getting like one frame a second. I'm 20 frames behind. If I hit the bid button, nothing happens. Uh, it it was and, and like the stuff wasn't that great, honestly. Um, it was every single thing we thought was going to be awful about having a whatnot auction in person is exactly what happened. And uh, I will say what I did like about the whatnot stuff was nothing at the auction. But I did like that whatnot was going around to tables and like with their camera crew out there and they were just doing live like, hey, let's go buy stuff. You want to buy something from Portland? Let's go to all the vendor tables. And I think that's the way it should be handled. Like that was cool. Like, oh, I couldn't make it to the show, but, you know, whatnot is walking around tables and they're letting me bid on stuff. That's neat. Uh, As opposed to the auction, which is an event that like generates money specifically for the show and it's kind of like uh you know an attendee event i feel like you know it was a live auction that got taken away from us uh but what they added on the other stuff i liked uh, so uh i wouldn't mind them coming back if they just didn't do the live auction again yeah i mean they're they're adding like that whatnot baggage on top of already like the lowest charisma least exciting live auction like the Portland yeah, they- auction is is re- it's run by the people who run the show like they really should get in like some young guys with some fucking energy not like old men <laughs> who run a show did um, pat did pat do it one year i have no idea i definitely am i hallucinating or was that a different show where he did the i mean auction? getting a literal professional entertainer to do it would be the thing to do uh, especially so, yeah, on like fucking like, what the, not the the auction was a disaster but to be clear the auction is never good like yeah. it's never something like i go to see my friends who i know are going to be sitting there and that's fun but the auction itself is always like too long and the stuff is questionable at best and um it's geared for a very specific crowd that is not me so i don't typically enjoy what's in there so even what not ruining it it's like what are you ruining exactly something i didn't yeah, there was like a signed Hideo Kojima anyways. Metal Gear Solid 2 plaque that was like the most interesting thing. And I'm like, oh, I'll bid on that. And it went from like over a thousand dollars for it, like literally just like a worthless plaque with a Kojima autograph. And I'm like, eh, you know, that guy's autograph is not that rare. <laughs> um, yeah. but, but going back to what you were saying, I think like what not walking around a convention floor, just going up to each vendor and taking like the best thing off their table and being like, Hey internet, we're selling the best thing off this vendor's table. A hundred dollars, hundred fifty dollars. Like that is, that's better than the concept of what not. Like the idea that I could watch a stream of like too many games, uh, a show I don't go to. And they're just going to walk around the floor and take the best stuff off every vendor's table and sell it. That sounds fucking awesome awesome that sounds like a goddamn event uh right and, like, and i can be at home and bid with be. my good internet what i'm like and i can be at home and bid with my good internet yeah i want i want someone to be i want there to be a whatnot channel that like goes around the country to game stores and just like hey you got that game that's not selling what if we just auction that let's start that at half at one dollar right now and see what the internet will pay for it and they just go to a game store and just like take like 10 other things and do that like i would watch that that would be great Yep. Uh, th- I think that would be cool. That's why I was saying I liked that happening. I found that to be exciting and interesting. And uh, <laughs> whereas the auction wasn't, that was. Yeah. So so good job, whatnot, on that one thing. Uh, anything else you have uh, to say about the show? Uh, only that we got to see new cases. I mean, this is in line with talking about like what's going on with graded games and everything is, uh, oh, yeah. CGC revealed their case and water revealed their new case. And we got to take a look at those and that was neat. Yeah. I, I thought the CGC case was super ugly. Um, honestly, when I got my hands on it, I kind of like the CGC cases. Like I thought I was going to think they were super dumb. Um, especially the insert. So it's the same idea as a WADA case. And I'm sorry, I won't go too long. I know there's a lot of people who don't care about created games, but, um, uh, so it's the same idea where it has like a, a different plastic, like a vacuum formed plastic insert and then a generic plastic case around it. So they have like four main sizes of cases, and then they can make as many like little cheap inserts as they want to accommodate all the different kinds of games. But the thing CGC does that WADA doesn't, Wada uses kind of the same style of case ish, 
uh, they put bubbles around all of their corners. So all their corners have like a big, like a chonky centimeter around it. So like nothing is touching those corners. Whereas Wada, they they make the their their vacuum formed insert the exact same size as the box. And you know what? Boxes are imperfect things. Boxes aren't even perfect rectangular prisms. Boxes bow out. Boxes have all these different things. You can't make a rounded plastic insert that's the exact same size as a box. So I'm always concerned that there's too much friction on water cases or that like it's pressing up against a corner that shouldn't be there or something or that they're too rough putting it in. I'm, I'm I don't know. I, I maybe it's just because I've seen water quality assurance problems where like there's rips on games that clearly shouldn't that, like the games appear overgraded. And I wonder if the case damaged them, things like that. Um, Wada had their new cases too, which are fine. They, they were like asking for feedback. They're were, they were constantly asking for feedback. What they wanted feedback on was like the label and like, God, like aesthetics is just like the least thing I care about in a case. I want, I want a case to one, keep the game safe and two, be as small to store as possible. Um, you know, cause, cause you know, you know, if I have one grade a game, I probably have a shelf of 10 graded games. I don't want them to take up fucking <laughs> i have probably 10 water graded dvd games it is fucking it is outrageous how how big they are um but the, i mean the primary benefit of Wada's new case is that they are much thinner um i think they're fine they- i think the top looks a little bit weird but whatever uh and they are they're definitely thinner than the the cgc cases i think i like the cgc cases more but then the water cases are thinner so they're thinner and they wash. connect together yeah they connect together i'm pretty sure the the cgc ones might do that too they might have some kind of nesting thing they They don't like connect Uh, as well but like they they like nest together whatever um uh, like is that even a pro like if if i I have all my shit lined up on a shelf i don't want them interlocked i want to be able to like slide one of them out why would i want them to like interlock with each other in case you're stacking anyways um i i think the new case is a big improvement as far as aesthetics and uh shelvability Right. Like, I, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, yeah. Thumbs up to it. Uh, CGC case is a little weird. If you're familiar with the comic book holders, I'm not, I kind of like I was with you a little bit. I held it and I was like, huh, I, I like the comic book CGC case. I love it. I love my graded comics. I love the way they feel. Um, CGC has that big label, you know, like for your comics and they've got like that big thing. So it's almost like an action figure blister pack. So it's kind of a form factor you would be used to, which I think gives it a certain light level of comfort. But if you've ever put action figures in a box and had to store them, what a huge pain in the ass it is. Uh, so I have some concerns there, but I, where I think CGC might win some points with people is, have you ever seen on the comics where it's like, a Spider-Man, like a special issue of Spider-Man, and they have like a sweet Spider-Man art that goes through like the grading and everything. It's just like a background image that the grading sits on top of. Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like if they start to get that with like Mario's and Zelda's and stuff, I think that'll be like, I think that's going to be like for people who really want just a display piece. I think that could go a long way. Sure. 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 And I mean, I mean, they're, they're obviously a huge company. I I don't know how conservative, like a company like Nintendo would be if they would be like sketchy about like, Oh, graded games. I hear there's controversy there, but like, I bet they could get fucking like master chief on on those boxes. Oh oh, yeah. Yeah. For sure. (laughs) Like, yes, I would prefer Nintendo. Um, I, I don't love the width of all the CGC cases. Like, I, I think it has some, I, I think the case is going to have an appeal to a certain group. Uh, I, by no means a thumb down, thumbs down. I think for some people, they're going to love that case. And I think some people are going to like the water case better. I know that's not like really a hot take. I, I don't really do graded games, so it doesn't really matter for me. Um, but I think the water case is an improvement. I think the CGC case is going to speak to a lot of people who like that CGC aesthetic and that action figure feel. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the general public starts to uh, like feel about these cases and uh, how people are going to have them next to each other. Cause they're definitely, if you're in that market, you're going to buy a high grade. If you're looking for high graded games, you're going to go to both of these companies. So you'll wound, wind up having a marriage of these two products sitting next to uh, each other on shelf. So I'm curious how they'll look together, which oh, is something oh, I haven't seen yet. They're going to look horrible. Just 
imagine putting a, an old style wad of cakes next to anything. It just looks like a disaster. Um, well, I'm not talking about. I'm talking about the new style cases. So, uh, it yeah. We'll see. I'm just saying I, like mismatched I, styles, I, but okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think the CGC case is better than the original Wada case, and I think I kind of like the Wada case for size purposes better than the new Wada case better than the new the current CGC case. But I think like I really think that's a coin flip for people. Okay, I mean you don't care at all because you're never going to grade a game. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm not. I, I'm I'm <laughs> literally just trying to give like a an unbiased like oh if I was doing this like what would I pick. You know, I'm just, I'm going through the mental exercise. I'm kind of torn because I think VGA still looks the nicest. Whatever whatever that they don't have case security, whatever that like, who knows what their expertise truly is on everything they grade. I think VGA looks the nicest. I think WADA clearly has the most expertise on video games. And I kind of like CGC, like I clearly like CGC's insert with the bubbles the best. So I kind of like a different aspect of all three companies, and that puts me back in a deadlock of where I don't want to get anything created still. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Yeah, so that's where I'm at. Cases, okay. graded games. We lost all our listeners there. Yeah, they're all, they're all dead. That's why we saved it for the end. All right, let's... Uh, we got anything else we want to say about this, or can we just get out of this? Johnny, uh, the first major uh, retro... Uh, vintage gaming content creator I could think of is Mark Bustler, classic game room. That dude made decades, like over 10 years of video game content, like Atari and television, fucking everything. Um, and then after that was the angry video game nerd who was obviously smash hit, super influential influencer. Uh, and he was into Nintendo, but also went back to like Atari Odyssey on occasion, Commodore 64, and then like did a little bit of newer stuff. And now kind of modern day, I think if we're looking specifically in terms of collecting influencer, who do you think, who do you think is the like biggest collecting influencer and not, not collecting focused, more like retro gaming people who are interested in retro gaming to uh, enough to watch a video, but they might not even want to play like a Nintendo game. The kind of people who would like watch an angry video game nerd episode 15 years ago. Uh, who do you think the biggest guy well, in the space is? I, well, that's a curious question for me because who are those people? Who are those people now? Cause those people don't like, do those people exist? Uh, are, is the line like drawn? Is it like all investors now or, and then people who just play games and then like some collectors in between. Like what who investors are, who don't are even people? register Who's on the, the scale. I'm talking about people with millions of YouTube subscribers. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like there's no investment channel that really does that. Um Okay. I think you have no idea then. If you're not coming up with anything, I think it's Scott the Wise would be the closest uh, Scott thing the now. Was, I I to- think I've watched some Scott the Waz videos, so sure. I know who Scott the Waz is and I've watched some of his videos. Okay, and I think the closest thing that Gen Z has to the angry video game nerd, because he does edge like kind of edutainment, like he'll he'll uh, like entertaining videos about playing games, but then he goes into a lot of video game history, specifically about like you know what all kinds of topics on older games. But he has like a clear penchant for like GameCube and newer type games, Uh, and I just think like even in just like who the influencers are. You can see the older stuff is getting a little bit long in the tooth. You go on Reddit game collecting. I'm, I'm telling you guys go on Reddit game collecting. Look at these collections. There are people who have like five Nintendo cartridges and a thousand DVD games. And that's their whole collection. They're just, they collect DVD games. They don't give a shit about your Nintendo cards. Gen Z's coming for you, man. They're coming for our games right, and they don't want them. They, That's what they're, they're coming. They're not coming. For. They're not coming. They're for not coming games, for your games. Gen Z is not coming for your games, guys. Retro gaming. It, it's not in vogue. Nostal- nostalgic gaming is in vogue. Retro gaming, I think, is falling out of favor until I see a change, until I see more people picking up games that are like way older than what they grew up with. Like. I'm concerned for the future of retro gaming because like there will always be like Metal Jesus and fucking John Riggs or whoever like the gaming influences are. They're not getting any younger. So like they're always going to be interested into like Nintendo games and what they're interested in. But going forward, what the future generations are into, if they are actually interested in quote unquote retro games versus just nostalgic games is uh, 
was interesting to me. Um, well, I mean, I, I also think what we call retro games is a moving target. I, just, I said that earlier, but like, and I, I don't think it's a, it's, you know, a scale that slides up and things fall off the bottom. So I just think we've got things fall off where, the bottom. What do you mean? Yeah. Like Atari fell off and that's not a retro consoles, game anymore. I, I mean, I think it is, but where, when people, when the newer generation, what they think of as retro gaming, I think like that, that moves, right? So yeah, all that stuff is still at the bottom, but they're not going to care about that because that's kind of aged out. What they're looking at is like, oh, hey, GameCube is now retro gaming. Did you know that the GameCube was retro gaming? Does that make the Xbox 360 retro gaming? Oh, people have been How calling Xbox 360 you... retro for a long time. <laughs> that's why. That's what I'm saying. So, like, so if those are if people, st- to me, I think, oh, Xbox 360 is modern. But if young kids coming in, you know, or 20 year olds are like, yeah, the Xbox 360 is uh, retro. I'm collecting retro games. That you know, our definitions, we're just not sharing the same definition. So they're not thinking like Nintendo. That's like way too old for them. That's like 1950s stuff. Might as well be like to me, that would be 1950s stuff. And they're like, yeah, that's ancient. I, why would I even look at that? Who even cares about that? I don't know anything about that. It's too old, too expensive for me. It's like when I think of classic cars, I'm like, yeah, 55 Chevy Bel Air. That, that sounds really sweet, but also that's like kind of old and I'm not going to go do that. Um, I'm just wondering if that's the same, if it's the same process. Uh, we'll find out in 2060 uh, when my prediction comes true that no one cares about video games anymore and we all die in a nuclear war. Well, hooray for 2060 when you can finally get those 2004 prices again, right? Oh, dude. Get those 2004 prices. I, Do you I know, mean, I will so, probably okay. just be dead by then. Again, so I think... I think there there are prices that could go down, but like I'm not I don't think like NES prices or even even like Atari prices, I don't think they're going to crash. I just don't think we're going to see them rise. I think they there are a lot of games that are going to stagnate, whereas we are kind of used to an environment where literally everything goes up. I could bring up the ooze on Sega Genesis and there will be a price graph where it starts at the very bottom and there's a mountain that grows out of nowhere for the fucking ooze. And it's like, what the what is who's paying seventy dollars for the ooze? And I I just don't think that things like that are going to carry into the future. I don't I don't see a future where the ooze grows from a seventy dollar game and you could just like hold on to it and will eventually turn into a five hundred dollar game because it will be so and so decades old. I think it will just stagnate and be some old game that only people from that era ever care about. Yeah, I can see that happening. I I think I can agree to that. All right, right. Johnny. Uh, Oh, you did bring up GameCube. I do want to... One more thing about Portland. Um, Speaking to the fact that people want nostalgic games, there are no GameCube games on the floor, and it wasn't because people didn't bring them. It is because people brought them and they got bought. Uh, Definitely the most popular console with the lowest stock was GameCube, Um, which is not surprising considering the market the past few years because GameCube has gone nuts. Uh, good luck if you're collecting GameCube right now, man. Maybe with these price crashes, like, is Pokemon Box, like, more affordable right now? I still feel like I never see, like, a truly complete in box Pokemon Box for sale. So good luck if you're collecting GameCube. I mean, I think that's been cooling if you look at the price graphs, but, you know, still. GameCube, still very expensive. All right. Uh, let's move on to a collector's question, Tyler. Let's get out of this and, and move on. Daddy Mulk asks, which of the two, which of the following types of collections would you rather own and why? One, most of your games are game box manual only, but are in dead mint condition. Or two, most of your games are 100% complete with all the inserts, but everything is in slightly worn condition. Let's say six or seven out of ten. Okay, you got an answer for that? Yeah, I'm taking the 100% complete stuff. Definitely. I not having something at all is definitely a bigger defect than condition. And I'm not a big condition guy to begin with. Like the more time goes on, um, like I I interact with a lot of people in like these graded games discords. And some people are just like really excited about condition, just like that point too, or just like 
resubmitting like different components to get higher grades like really excites them and man i just do not care i like having a nice game the same as everyone else but i can tell that like i am just not cut from the same cloth as those people yeah having all the having the thing and in this case having all the contents in the box having the thing is the most important thing to me so definitely taking the 100 percent complete stuff same uh, yeah i mean we already know i don't care too much about condition and i would much rather just everything be complete if i was investing if i thought that was like the route i was taking i would choose the opposite oh definitely um, like they people don't care about condition at all or uh, completeness at all there's so many yeah. complete in box graded games missing inserts missing posters and stuff you get that 9.6 box though you're in the money yep exactly so um but for me you know i just I would rather just be complete. And I haven't even done a good job of that. And that's something I've been working on. And what a pain in the ass it is. Just buy everything complete, guys. Just don't do this to yourselves. Yeah. I mean, honestly, if you're if you're putting the two collections side by side next to me and telling me to choose one, I'm going to take the ones with the better boxes and then buy the inserts to fix them. Because that will obviously be a lot cheaper than buying all the boxes to upgrade the other one. But if I have to be stuck with one forever, it's going to be the 100% complete one. Yep. Clearvis asks, what's the thing you sold from your collection that you regretted most? Why and did you buy it back? Johnny. Mm. I mean, I guess I sold my Genesis collection and then regretted it and immediately bought it back. <laughs> what? You <laughs> you bought it back in like a month later. What are you talking about? Yeah, I regretted it. I bought it back. Oh, my God. You sold it. To I, I I don't I don't I don't really sell things out of my collection. It's like a weird thing for for me to sell. like. As a kid, did I sell it? I mean, I lost everything I owned multiple times. Like literally everything I ever owned went away. So why do you think I have like twelve thousand games sitting in this house, Tyler? So did I regret losing those things? Yes, to such a degree that I became a fucking internet weirdo and have been hoarding games ever since. So. Y yes they just i'm gonna give a blanket yes yes all the things okay johnny i don't sell things as you might know that's a lie you did you sell <laughs> lots of things i i sell some things um when i was hanging out on game teasy this is maybe 10 years ago let's say they had some kind of thread where it was like everyone like puts stuff up. it was like a mystery box type thing where like you you give a game you get a game and so when it came time for me to give a game, I look at my shelf and I have just like, you know, one of these shelves just full of random stuff that's been following me around my collecting life forever. And you have to put in like, to get something good, you have to put in something good. And one of the games I have was WarioWare Twisted. I bought this new, this was like a mint copy of WarioWare Twisted. This this was a while ago, and like Game Boy Advance was not super exciting to me. It was probably worth like fifty bucks at the time. Uh, so I, I I sent that out, and I I got some like complete garbage back. I'm sure because I, I was mainly I was mainly participating for the social aspect of it. I just wanted to like be part of something. Um, and I don't sell a lot of stuff, but I remember and am pained by the things I do sell. And now WarioWare Twisted, what does a WarioWare Twisted go for, Johnny? Yeah, probably a hundred dollars. I don't know. I do. Work. I do not believe you. I think it's like a two hundred dollar complete in box. Is it? Yeah, I'm I mean, only seeing just... sealed ones, and they're all like eight hundred. There's not even like oh a complete in box. Yeah, it's and, like it's like one hundred seventy five bucks. It's kind of hard insert to get. Like gross. So, the problem is that. Uh, WarioWare Twisted, I don't even think is like that great of a game. I love the original WarioWare. All the other WarioWares are like fine. But because I had this and I had a really nice copy and I no longer have it, every time I look at like a copy, I like Portland Retro Gaming Expo when people want $200 for it, it pains me that I uh, that I gave it up. So that is the one that comes to mind that, uh, that I gave up. And no, I didn't buy it back because it's too fucking expensive now. It's not worth it. One day when I go and buy literally every Nintendo game that's ever been made, I'll have to go buy that back. But when I do that, I'm going to have to decide if I if I do that in English or Japanese. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah. No, I, I don't... I'm sorry. I just don't have something like that. I, I, mean, I think I said once that I sold Ogre Battle to GameStop, and that made me realize uh, I should never sell anything to GameStop ever again. And uh, 
my sadness resolved and uh then i also just vowed to keep every game i ever bought uh yeah good good strategy it's it's really led you somewhere important in life here now that we're talking about buying video games and how how the market might shift and how we buy video games in the future Play i love video talking games. about video games i love this I, I'm what honestly about? what like, a great decision. I, I haven't recorded in a month now because you did the last show, and I've been like itching to talk about video games, Johnny. I've been I'm, wanting to. I'm uh, glad. I'm glad to hear discuss it. some stuff. Talk about it. All right. Uh, let's uh, let's talk about some video games some more, Tyler. You have a list that I'm sure is tremendously large. What did you buy, Tyler? I mean, no, like when I was sick, I wasn't buying anything. So really, no. But yeah, but you have all the time before that, and everything you bought at Portland. I mean, yeah, I, like I bought some junk at Portland. I bought like what's championship bowling on NES. There was like a nice complete in box for eight bucks. And I'm like, I'm not going to let an eight dollar complete in box Nintendo game slip by me. No, the uh, the best thing I bought. Well, I've got like 500 manuals. Like the main thing I do at shows when I can't find video games I want to buy, I get all give me all your health and safety inserts, all your warranty cards all your little bullshit that I know I'll need, especially like the generic stuff, like those Nintendo 64 inserts, those uh, those Super Nintendo inserts that like almost every game comes with. Because man, the difference between th- this goes back to Daddy Milk's question: the difference between a cart insert box game and just seeing like that one insert that's like, oh, it's got that insert. It just looks so much better when you have it all laid out. And uh, yeah. all those guys there, they they all want like a dollar each for it, and like. Even if you were selling a copy of Breath of Fire 2, I'm just going to pick an expensive game, you will get significantly more than a dollar more if you have, like, the bonus dollar insert there. Just because it will look Absolutely. so much more complete. Yep. Um, n- but don't don't go around and, and buy all those inserts at shows, because that's what I do. Uh, yeah, don't give away your strategy. Yeah. Also, uh, Josh Byerly had... Um, had all these Tengen uh, registration cards. So all I'm the so Tengen games have unique those. registration cards. And he had like 10 of them. And like, I'm going through all the inserts. And I'm like, Josh, I'm just going to buy all these, Josh, because this this is like amazing shit. I want all your shit. Um, I don't have like more than half of those Tengen games. But because I have the warranty cards and because Josh gave me such a good deal on all all the stuff he sold me. I feel obligated to go buy all those Tengen games now to use those warranty cards. I feel like it would be disrespectful to Josh for him to give me a good deal on that stuff and for me to not use it. So now I'm going to have to go on eBay and buy all the Tengen games. Just send just send them to me and I'll put them in my nope, Tengen games. Nope, I got to use them. It's disrespectful. That, w- that would be using them. Uh, yeah. Best thing I got, obviously, nine at, 9.5 out of 10 Link to the Past with the cellophane on it. Uh, nothing's going to beat that. And then the best thing I got from Japan, Johnny, I finally got a copy of Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. I have been looking for this game for so long, not because it's rare, but because MSX games, uh, the plastic on the front, it must be like a humidity thing. It crinkles really easily. So, so many of the copies look wrecked or like the edge of the insert popped out and it's worn at the top. And this is like a $500 game. So I don't want a shitty copy of Metal Gear 2. Uh, so one finally came up that's not wrinkled and and it looks nice. So I, I got my copy of Metal Gear Two, and I didn't even nice. pay five hundred dollars. I'm pretty sure. So pretty cool. Yeah, I would like to have a Metal Gear Solid Two. Uh, you probably have Metal Gear Solid Two. I would, metal, I would bet you have Gear multiple 2. copies of Metal Gear Solid Two. Uh, not not Metal uh, Metal Gear Two. I meant I know Metal Gear Two. Um, oh, Snake's Revenge. But, yeah, you you love that game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But I do have Metal Gear 2 for the MSX because I too got Metal Gear 2 for the MSX no, during the No, did you buy it period. at Portland? No, I got it from Red the Game Shark. Red oh, the Game Shark. If wait, you need what the fuck? Cheap I, import games. Wait, get, wait, he got that for you from Japan? Yeah. Didn't I tell him to buy that for me from Japan? But so when Red I was in Japan, first, I didn't have a copy of this game yet. <laughs> I told him first. So... He prioritized you over me, the guy who's I constantly asking first. for computer. There's no way. I must have asked him like at least a year ago, like at least mentioned to him, like, no. "Hey, I'm looking for a Metal Gear Two. If you could find one, get out of here. Get out of here with your jealousy. Oh. We both got one. Just be happy." <laughs> I'm so jealous. Uh, 
All right, yeah. Um, hey, Megashark.bandcamp.com. There's a new uh, Red the Game Shark album out, uh, guys. Yeah, it's, uh, it's Castlevania, Castlevania and you guys should go check it out. You should. Uh, it's great. Uh, go listen to Red play uh, all the Castlevania tunes. They're super good. He even plays some of the Famicom versions, which is awesome. Uh, anyways, so I got I got that, but it's got crinkly case, Tyler. Ooh, it's got so the maybe you didn't yeah. Want. It's really hard to. But, there's probably like a generic game that you could buy that has the same exact case, you, but I, yeah. I didn't want to deal with that. Tyler. It is so mint. Aside from that, the case is like dumb, but everything else is so beautiful. It's nice. ridiculous. You gotta send me pictures. I want to be jealous. Okay, I thought I thought I told you about this. I I don't remember at all, but also like my brain has not worked for three weeks, so it could be that. Okay. Yeah, so that that was really cool. I got that, Tyler. I I bought so much stuff that it's like kind of, it's kind of embarrassing, and I don't like. Should I even talk about all of it, or should we just move on? Sure. You know what? This is a short episode, Johnny. Tell me some bullshit that you bought. <laughs> okay. Uh, hey, remember what I was alluding to? Like a, a big dumb purchase I made. Uh, I bought I bought a bunch of Vita games. You know, I bought some Vita games at Portland because I'm getting. Close on the set, and I'm close on the set because uh, a a friend on Instagram, uh, Peyton, who also has more Vita games. If you are interested, uh, I can I can shout him out. I'll send I'll put a picture in my Instagram, and you can and I'll tag him, and you, and you can check his stuff out. But he sent me uh, not for free or anything for a, lo- a good sum of money, a good deal, but a good sum of money uh, about. A hundred Vita games, Tyler, and then I bought what like ten at Portland, and now I'm like six away from the set. Not counting the weird like, does this game really count? Did it ever come out? Games. Not counting those, I'm about six away. You need you need those games. Uh, what what's one of them? Uh, uh, v- Binding v- of v- Isaac. V- is that is that like this game exists but never came out? Yeah. Oh, Vita is so stupid. Why do you do this to yourself? I'm not. I'm not getting those games. I don't care about those games. You know, those I are the only games I would care about. That's I like know. an interesting story. But, oh, there's a game but, that exists that maybe shouldn't. That's weird. But no, but let me get all these could, girly anime visual novels from limited it, run games. Yeah, yeah. It, but it could come out. It could still be released. They're supposed to still be released. So you never know. Probably not. Uh, and then everyone will fight over. You know, these like last couple of games. Uh, what are they like? Uh, oh man, what? Are, hold, hold on, I'll I can bring up the list of uh, of them if you really want to know what uh, is supposed to exist on on the Vita. But uh, everyone's on the edge of their seats. Yeah, I, I just I forget their names. Like, uh, uh, did, did I put a classification for this? Hold on, unreleased. I think I put them as uh, VVV Revenge of the Bird King, Binding of Isaac, One Thousand and One Spikes, and then. War Theater exists, but I think that was like a South American release or something only. Um, so yeah, those are some games I have on my list. But there's a ton of other Vita games you can go get. You you can go pretty deep with the Vita because there's a bunch of games that are in English that were released through like PlayAsia and a couple other companies. There's like another hundred games. So I've I've got a big Vita list of all the things that are available. But for the set of released games in North America, I'm missing six now. So. That's it. So thank you, Peyton, for the great deal. Hope everything is going well for you. Um, yeah. And I, his name isn't really Peyton, but that's what it is. Uh, anyways, I'll, I'll link him and you can talk to it. I, I don't know if he wants his like full real name set, so I'm going to avoid doing that. Do you think that Switch collecting has eaten into Vita collecting? Yes, because Nintendo basically. <laughs> because every good Vita game is on the switch now well everything's the on the switch but also if people want like a high definition like powerful handheld like vita was the thing and then switch is mm-hmm. like oh yeah no we're the thing and guess what we're nintendo so we win yeah 100 <laughs> percent. and then like they're like oh but you don't have all the weird visual novels and now they're like yes we do and like oh okay well i guess if i can just play everything uh that was on the vita here then i might as well yeah like you know there, the switch collecting is crazy. It switch collecting is such madness. Um, like I kind of want to get the we we got to talk to him, but uh, Jeffrey Wittenhagen, 
He's got the Switch Collector volumes. I'm just like curious to flip through those books because Switch collecting is such madness. Uh, I would just like to know more. Uh, yeah, yeah. I talk to Jeffrey Wittenhagen a lot. He's probably one of the people I talk to most at Portland. Um, uh, yeah, the guy's super yeah, nice. So, a super nice guy. Uh, check out his books. I think you can find him on HagensAlley.com. Right? Is that is that it? Yeah. Or is that something else? Yeah. Okay. Um. Anyways. Uh, what else did I buy? I, I mean, you saw all the, I posted all the Halloween stuff I bought. Plus I bought more stuff. Plus Mr. CIB brought me a bunch of Game Boy games and Game Boy Color games that I bought and a bunch of Switch games. Tyler, I bought so much stuff. I spent so much money. It was, it was dumb. It was, and then I bought a thousand dollars in manuals because I'm stupid. Ah, That was a good deal. Whatever that guy. It was such (laughs) a good deal. I couldn't stop myself. He had manuals priced with like, did they have stickers on them? It was like they price 2017 or before. Like these were old prices on manuals and we were just digging through them and it was like, okay, like a dollar for this, $3 for this. Like, are you serious? And then it comes to a point where you're just like, I think I should buy all of these. <laughs> yeah. And cause Tyler had probably, what'd you have? You probably had about 150, $200 worth of manuals from him at that point or like maybe only a hundred, but you had like a chunk where I was already like, because I was going to buy you those manuals. I was like, all right, I'm going to buy these for Tyler. How deep am I already? Should I just go? All, and then I had like $200. I think you had $100 worth of stuff. I had $200 worth of stuff. And then it was just like, should we just take the rest? Should we just get the rest? And uh, we did. We did. And uh, it was a really good deal. But it was just manuals. And I did not need most of them. But you might. What if you do people who collect, if you like are like us and you get manuals, you are just like a doomsday prepper of games. Yeah. And you I know what? Well, I have a theory. I, I have something I'm working towards with these manuals. And I've told you about this. Okay. And this is going to be for our Patreons. I, I'm going to do kind of like a manual collective where people get to list all the manuals and stuff they have. If you have incomplete games And then that way everybody knows who has what manuals available and you can work out deals. And if I got it for a dollar, maybe I can just send it to you or I don't care. Like that that just so because manuals are a pain in the ass to come by and like you can only really go find them at conventions. So I want to like set this up and then, you know, just take care of the people who take care of me. It's crazy where like if I have a game that's missing a manual, like a Super Nintendo game, let's say like. I would pay half the value of that game to get that manual because it is so bothersome to me that the game is incomplete. Like, it feels worthless to have a game without a manual. And I'm sorry if you collect games uh, without manuals, but like, it uh, is me. Yeah, it, and I don't feel the same. It bothers me so much to not have a manual. Like, I could live not even like not having a poster, I could put that as like a to do list. But like, if I don't have a manual, that's like an emergency that I need to fix right now. But you go to like a show and people are like, oh, yeah, just like the manuals for all the most popular Nintendo games ever. Yeah, those are those like four bucks, <laughs> like Super Mario World, Super Mario Kart, Super Metroid. Super Metroid might be like ten dollars. Hold on. But like, I can't believe how cheap they are compared to. Uh, yeah, like how expensive we got Adventure of Batman and Robin. It was like a twenty dollar manual. Yeah, and, and how like, much is we, that game we talked about this. We, we talked about the premium. What did we talk about this like three episodes ago where it's like. People still don't value the manuals and like complete games properly. You were just talking about the dumb health and safety inserts. What if you buy the manual for cheap and you have the health and safety insert and then you just put those in the game, you're going to like triple what a carton box would go. Yeah. Like it just it's dumb. The the X factor, you know, on, on these is way higher than what what they should be. People and and naturally, because if the card is the most important thing, and then like the box is the thing that holds the most important thing, the manuals is like who cares? But I still don't think the individual components are priced correctly. Um, yeah, I, I still think that those prices are soft. Anyways, that's a long held opinion. I don't need to go into it. Anyways, I, I bought a lot of stuff, and I, I think I forgot some stuff. Oh my god, dude! Uh, I bought some switch aims. Oh, and did I mention? Oh, I think I mentioned the Super Famicom games I got from guys over at Lost Joystick Network. Yeah. Anyways, I try to try. I, try I got to so much my stuff. pickups to the most interesting things. So can we instead of saying Super Famicom games, maybe pick the most interesting Super Famicom game you got? Super. Tell Metroid. us about it. Super Metroid. Super. Great. <laughs> 
Uh, what's that one? No, about? actually, the the most interesting one is uh, the Donald Duck. Oh God, what's it called? No magic. I, I I'm not going to get the name right, but it's a it's a unique game for the Super Famicom that did not come out in America, and it's kind of rare there. It's like a weirdly expensive Famicom game. I mean, expensive for Super Famicom games. Yeah. Um, and I got that. It's a Japanese exclusive. Didn't release anywhere else. So, you know, you know me. I love to get my Disney games. It is weird that there are Japanese exclusive Disney games. You would think. Yeah, and there's more than a you Donald would think. Duck game there's, on there's Super a, Nintendo would be such a no brainer. <laughs> I know, and especially like, and the game was like kind of well received. So I, I, yeah, I don't know what happened. But I, I have to post pictures of that. But I couldn't post pictures of any of the stuff because I was doing all the Halloween stuff, and literally, I, I've just debated making my, my, uh, my Instagram page just Halloween for the full year because I literally have enough games that I could post, Tyler, that I have not shown where I could post a year solid without repeating. All right, good. But I don't know if I want to do that. That's like oh. an awful lot of commitment to. Uh, to do that. And then I would never be able to show like the new cool stuff I got. And that would be sad. Cause like, I want to show off this Donald Duck game and people should see it. It's cool. Anyways, Johnny, you're uh, uh you talking about your stupid Vita games that you bought reminded me of a story. Okay. Uh, tell me a story. All right. And it was at Portland retro gaming expo. It was at the booth to diagonally across from us. There was a guy who came to Portland with nothing but Vita games. Oh, are you going to tell the Josh Byerly story? Uh, so I don't, I don't even do, should we even out him? Like, I, I don't think he would care. So <laughs> this guy, there are some people who come to Portland and like that it's a commitment. Like you're traveling, you're paying and you're standing there for three days and you have to lodge yourself for two nights. It's, it's expensive and it's a lot of time. And this guy came here just with Vita games. Did he have like every Vita game? It was, he, he just like selling his Vita collection he, for three straight days. He did, and I, I could have completed my set there, but he was a little overpriced. Basically, I was just paying what I would have paid on it. He, his prices weren't great, and he was uh, not cutting great deals. Yeah, and, and like 20,000 people there. I don't know how many people are there looking for like obscure, girly, visual novel Vita games. Um, there was also but, more Vita games than I expected to be there, so, and they didn't look like they were doing well. Yeah. Well, what, I mean, honestly, what a shocker. You, you could have said the same thing about Vita at any point in Vita's history. I, I, yes, I understand that. I'm just making, making the point. So this guy, this guy's at the show, the retro gaming show, selling not retro games, just saying. Uh, only Vita games, very limited audience. And you know what? He still has a lot of games that, that have, have uh, that he has. And then all of a sudden... The clouds part from the convention center ceiling. And a ray of light. A ray of light shines directly on him. God comes and speaks directly to this man's face. Josh Byerly walks up to this man, looks at his booth. Josh Byerly, if you don't know, we mentioned him a lot on the show. He's a major collector. He's been around forever. Uh, knows everything about variants for Atari and Nintendo. Um, it has a huge collection. And Switch. And Switch, because he's a maniac. Because he's a what? He's a maniac. He loves modern variants. Why'd you say Twitch? I oh, said Switch. Switch. Oh, yeah. He, yeah. D dude, dude loves collecting video games. He goes to this guy's booth, and he's like, what do you want for everything? And the guy doesn't give him an answer. And, like, he starts like, oh, you know, I don't really know. And Josh is like, no, <laughs> you know what games you have. What do you want for everything? The best answer would be to think about it for a second and say like $8,000 or the, the less good answer is like, give me five minutes. Let me add it up, give you a discount. And then we could talk about it. This guy doesn't give him a price. You're motherfucking here with hundreds of Vita games of like a guy who is seriously interested in buying out your entire table comes up to you. And you don't give him a price. This is that you could have gone home. You could stop being. You're gonna be stuck with these fucking Vita games, selling them one at a time for the rest of your life. Someone comes and offers you basically thousands of dollars because it would have been thousands of dollars to take this burden off of you, and you reject it. It would the craziest thing I've ever heard at 
an expo. This was not like a a collector who was here to trade and deal. This was a guy who wanted to get rid of all his Vita games, was given the opportunity, and fucking didn't. Ah! <laughs> the, uh, yeah. Just the it, most it was nuts the, thing. Uh, I mean, we talked about it extensively, and I w- was so confused. It was just like, this is the dream, right? If you were at your booth, the dream is to have someone come up and say, how much for everything, stranger? I'll take it. <laughs> and you're just like, yes, let me find a price that just sends me home and pays me. And like, great, wonderful. And this guy's like, mm, I don't know. So the thing is, what also, do you mean you don't know? Like if one, like the guy. I mean, maybe, maybe I'm expecting a lot. Like the guys probably just have known who Josh Barley was. But <laughs> the thing is, Josh was. He was buying this because he's like, oh, I could basically have a Vita collection in one go. Like, if I could do that, yeah, let me, if I could do that, yeah, sure, why not? Let me see if I could do that. I, I, I don't know and if Josh the guy saw his somebody vendor who badge won't sometimes. spend money on games. It's not like he's like, like, if you've watched Josh at like any of the Portland auctions or anything, you'll know Josh is someone who is willing to spend some money. Like, he, he is a guy who buys games in quantity and of quality. So he is someone, he, he's not like, Oh, uh, let's like, let me try to wring every penny out of you. He's a guy who's going to spend money. So, and yeah, what a missed opportunity. I, I don't know if like the guy thought he was like just a reseller who was trying to get like a, a scoop deal to Even resell Vita games. Who the who fuck cares? is reselling a full set of Vita games, first of all? <laughs> but like, that's not what he was doing. He wanted your fucking games. But also who cares if it's a reseller? I don't care if a reseller buys me out. If you were going to pay my price for my things, cool. Because I don't know if you know, but when I sit at a booth and I have things for sale, the goal is to sell them. I don't know if that dawned on you. I just had to bring up that story because I remembered reacting similarly when I heard it the first time. Just So, I yeah. I'm I'm that's the dumbest thing I saw and second to the guy who's like 10% after you've already spent $300 here for no way. And it's just like, all right, we'll go home with those games forever, I guess then. Yeah. You Not know, like I didn't have room for them improved. it turned out, so you know, it's a good thing I didn't buy them. Um Yep. I should have bought them. But it, like on principle, I would I didn't want to pay his price on principle cuz they they sat there for 3 days. But uh Yep. Anyway, anyway, we got anything else, not Johnny? Euphoric. No, I don't. Let's close it out. Yeah. Tyler. I'm Default Gen, Default G E N. Get me on the Instagram or video game sage or Discord. Yeah, and I'm Johnny, Johnny underscore Ayuchi, and you can find me on Instagram and also on our Discord. Hey, and if you want to join us on our Discord, you can do that by going to patreon.com slash collectors quest and joining us at the two dollar level and if you want our bonus content you can get us at the four or the six dollar level the four dollar level is the sweet spot uh so that's what what i would recommend six dollars is just like hey i really extra like you guys and i i get a couple of minor benefits anyways you can do that like i said patreon.com slash collectors quest that's it for the show thank you so much tyler anything else uh no All right, (laughs) then you all know what comes next. Bye! That is our show. Uh, Errata for the show. I I put this note. I don't even remember where I said this. At some point, I said Eternal Warriors for the Sega Genesis. I meant Eternal Champions. Guaranteed, like, two people messaged me before they got to this part of the show telling me I'm an idiot. Also, I've talked to a few people, like four different people, who think they're not getting shouted out at at the patron thing at the end when they're supposed to be. And I think, like, two of them were right, and the other two of them are wrong. So if I emphasize your name here, it's because I'm proving to you that I'm saying your name. Uh, thank you to 8-Bit, 8bit.bandcamp.com, APE Like the Monkey. He does our intro music. And thank you to the patrons, Richard, patron number one, Bowden, Canadian variant alert, Chris Glidden, Nintendo World Tan... Nintendo World Champion, Daniel Jacksvick, high-end collector, Andrew Brim. Greeting, stranger. I'm not surprised to see Andrew Shelton around here. 
50 Hertz is good enough for me, Andre. Video games were meant to be slabbed. Brandon Ackley, Brian Gupta, and Pocky and Rocky with Becky, the strictly limited super rare Bruno, coin operated Cameron Couch, Fat Cat Collector Chris Jackson, Chris SNK, too many is as at Smorozek, Johnny's GBA hookup, Coffee with Mr. Saturn, Playing with Power, Connor Strange, The Last Game You Need for the Set, Corey O'Brien, Unpunched Hang Tab, Dustin Beagle, He Has Returned to Judge This City, Eric Addison, What Do You Buy In, GBO Metric, Red Pyramid Thing, Jonathan Shados, Joseph Garris, He's Just Out There Having a Good Time Achieving His Goals, Proud of You. Also, I probably should have said this earlier because I'm sure everyone shuts off the show at this point. I'm going to uh, make the... We did a... Whatever it's called. CQ After Dark. I'm going to make it available to all patrons because I feel bad that last episode uh, wasn't there. So, uh, honestly, we have so many people that are signed up at the 4 and $6 level that it's not even going to matter. But for the people who are at the $2 level, you get, a, you get an After Dark. Right? Where was I? Did I say Joseph Garris is out there having a good time achieving his goals? I'm still proud of him. The Nintendo Tape Archivist, Joseph Leo, The Chosen Undead, Joshua Gelb, saw him at Portland, played pinball, had a great time. Lance Lord Hardstyles-y, saw him at Portland, we didn't get to play pinball. Commander Mark Halstead, and this is his favorite store on the Citadel. The Degenerate Matt Fall, posted in the Discord right now, Michael Chiaramonti. Mike, Michael, all right. Mid condition, Mora Bros, Mr. CIB, get your loose Genesis carts out of here. Uh, someone has a Captain America completing box on Game Boy. You should probably sell it to Mr. Sib. It's getting pretty close to that set. Nicholas Mad Dog, <laughs> Nicholas Mad Dog McCree DiMaggio, Funko Land employee, platform agnostic, Red the Game Shark. The Famicom Box Retro Game Enthusiast. They could be Ghosts and Goblins twice, Sheffish, Sean, the Gamer Collective, the New Craft, who could beat Mega Man without the pause trick, previously unknown variant Tim Walker, from the internet, Todd Fisher, can't put limits on collecting, BG Collectaholic, The Willennium, Will Joe, Keeper of the Zelda variant, Zero X Dev Code, previous game collector, Adam Cavanaugh, getting the full PS2 set because Stefan won't, all caps. What a 9.8, A++ Benji, the actually rare, Bird Dog Gaming, dropping the Mario 64 Penguin off the map, Brandon Chalker, Brandon Rogers, whose favorite episode is the wrestling episode, Christopher Piper, still shaking from what he found at Goodwill, still finding deals in 2022, Colton Murphy, a winner is him, David Green, Derek Lauer, who made me edit this show, Don Libby, the hero of time, Double Ugly presents Double Ugly, the official game of the movie, actually understands the Zelda timeline, Jeff Pierce, the, sh the actual Shinobi, Jasonic the Kid, Jeff the Game Boy Ferris, he is error, Jeff Russell, Jeremy Jarvis, here for the Pog Talk. Voice is cracking because I'm still, uh, still kind of sick. Don't get cool, guys. Jeremy Madsen and the Order of No Quarter. Joe actually plays his games, Champ Pity. Video game art collector because video games are art. Justin Chichio. Kevin Zylog Z80 Zaker. Zylog Zillog? I don't Strands type game, Chris Shipley. What a horrible night to have living in bits. Nick the video game database, Morgan. Homebrew mastermind, Divertov. Off the map, MZ collector. The primary guy who collects Korean releases, peaceful games. Dungeon master, Reed Stubenick. The promoter, retro RPG podcast. Halo! Sean Razine. Sean Razine, by the way. Uh, after Johnny's solo podcast, the day after that posted, like, the least listened to episode of Collector's Quest in a long time, Sean Razine signed up for the Patreon, so shout out to Sean Razine, the biggest Collector's Quest fan. Tex, who collects for Jaguar, Tom Obscure Variant Chaser Chase, Zaventorian, he knows all 97 Nintendo games, 32 bits or less, do the math! Andrew actually collecting Engage. Oh, Ben Parker, a bad enough dude to rescue the president. Chesno, all your base are belong to him. Colby, he is Sinistar. Corhagen does what Nintendo don't. Daniel McArdle, who thought this was the Retronauts Patreon. The modern database, Danny Gomez. I actually don't remember if Dan thinks that uh, I, I wasn't saying his name. The modern database, Danny Gomez. Dara Sadat, welcome to die! The 
the philatelist, dork overlord, my childhood PlayStation idol, Game-Rave.com, Rip and Tear, Jackson Kubler, he is 8-Bit, John Brown, Joseph Rogers got 50,000 on Double Dragon, collector of everything, including Atari, Kalen McAteer, video game console modding guy, MP3, Sam Sigamark 3 Marks, Sean the video game Illuminati LaCroix, and Hegemon of the Geek Empire, Vildor the Great. Thank you guys so much.